Lots of comedy entertainment this Christmas on BBC One. A special Christmas, are you being served? Suggesting that I'm on the fiddle? No, but you could be tuning up. <laughs> An out-of-season party in Heidi High. Mr. Fairbrother, do we or do we not look ridiculous? <laughs> Only Fools and Horses and the Trotters face yet another Christmas of TV and Grandad's Cookie. And Terry and June also look forward to Christmas television. What time is it? Uh, nearly 11. You're in luck. Your favourite film's on BBC Two. Lassie, come home. <laughs> and there's a Christmas Day last of the summer wine. Oh, Merry Christmas, Mrs. Edward. Douglas, it's for you. There's a tramp at the door. <laughs> Hello. I'm Andrew. I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 30. Yes, of, of Around the Archives. Yes, which is the Christmas special. Yes, so happy Christmas! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only correction from episode 29 yes. is um, frump, yes. not crump. Yes, sorry, I've got, got my C's and my F's mixed up. So Morticia's side of the family in the Adams family oh, frumps. are the frumps. Yeah. Uh, Crump, the only th- reference I can think of is uh, Mrs. Crump Pinnit in the new gas cooker sketch in uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Okay. And to be very picky, uh, the part played uh, by Terry Jones is Mrs. Pinnit, mm-hmm. and the gas cooker is intended for Mrs. Crump. Right. But they ask her to sign it Mrs. Crump Pinnit. Right. Okay. Okay, yep. Yeah. That's just terribly complicated. Yes. But anyway, mm. first things first. Yes. Uh Christmas Terry and June. Yes. For which Warren will join us. He will. <laughs> Good King Wenceslas last lost out upon the feast of Stephen. The snow was up to his knees and it was very crisp and even. That's worse than the kids on the bl- on the blooming show, Warren. June! <laughs> Terry and June Christmas show number one. Yes. Twenty third of December nineteen eighty. Mm-hmm. Um quarter past seven. In the mm. evening, following Angels, mm-hmm. Christmas at St. Angela, Angelism before the Christmas comedy classic The Likely Lads, and then The Dawson Watch. So it's mm. a real like comedy mm. yes. lineup. But I get the feeling you enjoyed that more than you thought you were going to. Mm. I, yes, I did. Yeah, because we <laughs> said we said we're going to do Chris, we're going to do Christmas Terry and June's, and mm. you went oh, all right mm. if you want to. <laughs> But even from the start, I think you were subverted, weren't you? Because yes. you were expecting Terry in the like the what's the opening title? It's the, it's expecting... the railway station, isn't it? They uh, yes. keep missing each other. We had we had the cheap advent calendar. Didn't yeah, it? but what was the railway station? Oh, um, um, was it East Croydon? East Croydon, East yeah. Croydon, and they yeah. go through the shopping centre and they things keep like that. losing each other. That's and... the one. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, there's some advent calendar with some mysterious hand coming in. We don't even know whose hand <laughs> no. it is. I should have had the Monty Python gorilla hands come across. <laughs> but two years ago, we mentioned this in passing. Where yes. you said, because this is the one where about the fur coat. Yes, it? It, yes. Is. Yeah. it is. Yes. And you said at the time mm. you wouldn't have wanted a fur no. coat. No, I would never want a fur coat, which is, I, I suppose it's a bit hypocritical of me because I have worn leather shoes and I had a leather coat and I do eat meat, but I don't agree with Did fur. Did you have Parker? Yes. Not, well, that not was original fake fur, though, yes, wasn't it's it? Fake, yeah. fake, fake fur all the time, yes. yes. You said yeah. Parker, I thought you meant bloke off a Thunderbird. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the fur coat thing is not really a huge part of the 
plot, really. It's it's more oh. a series of sketches, it again, is. isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. you've got... Um, it's almost a archetypal British um, farce, isn't it? Yeah. That's all mm. it is. Whoops, Vicar, where's me trousers? Because you've got a bit where they go to the charity shop. Yes. yes. And you said, what would a charity shop have in 1980? Yeah. Because you keep finding things in charity shops from I, yeah. earlier than 1980, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I was mm. finding things yesterday... Um, the annual from Cracker Jack with Michael Aspel on the front cover. And you said you said you found some Magpie books. Oh, as well. I've actually found the first Magpie album as well. Album? Al- album. <laughs> Sing along a Magpie. Did you know that one? Magpie uh, book annual. Yes. And you said you tracked down a load of Blue Peter ones the other yep, week as well. Yep, mm-hmm. they're, they're in Weymouth. Yeah. But yeah, what would a charity shop in 1980 have? Yeah, exactly. Well, the answer is not much because it's quite a sparse <laughs> set, isn't it? It's mm. very sparse set. Although it's got um, Daphne Oxenford and Patsy Smart in it. Yes. You wouldn't want them served up with onions. Would you? Selling <laughs> Christmas cards for um, charities, for various charities. <laughs> yeah. And it's weird because it's obviously charity shops now are. Because this this looks like it's a charity shop for all sorts of different charities. Yeah, yeah. Where it's charity think, shops yeah. now, it's for the British Heart Foundation yeah, or Cats specific, Protection yeah. or whatever. So you know what you're getting when you go in. So yeah. no, no, no. I was, I was just reminiscing. Um, my auntie lived in Notting Hill, and she used to live above War on Want, was right. the charity shop. And I always remember it being a very sparse place very dark and sparse shop yeah with absolutely next to nothing in it but come christmas it was just jam packed full of christmas cards for all sorts of charities and did it have that charity shop smell yes warm dust yeah it's <laughs> it's just weird that yeah you know because obviously going um to a side of uh, the, the the new doctor, Jodie Whittaker's doctor, got mm. her outfit from a charity shop. So she's just taking that charity shop smell all around the universe. Old men's trousers. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get too warm in them. No. Um, oh. But, but Terry buys this um, <laughs> fake... Uh, Christmas tree that he can't put together. Yeah. So you don't need to do that anymore. They mostly come fitted, don't they? And you yeah. just fluff them. Vroom, vroom. But do you remember yeah. when yeah. we got our first big Christmas tree? Oh gosh, tree yes, at, that at was Gilligan complicated. Lisa. You did have to fit it into the base, didn't you? Yeah, but because it, it was a fibre optic one. Yeah, but oh, okay. we got it in Gillingham, mm. and we only had to drive it like. Sort no, of we didn't get it in Gillingham. We got it in Yeovil, didn't we? Did no, we no, no, we got oh, it. We got the tree in, in, Gillingham, the tree in Gillingham, Gillingham and the decorations in Yeovil. And we had Yeovil. to drive it half a mile up the road. But you couldn't see because it was so big. I don't want to admit this to Warren <laughs> as a policeman. But well, we, I think that the worst thing you've admitted, you've been to Yeovil. <laughs> well, we had to stick it in the back seat. Yeah. yeah. And you had to sit in the back because the front bit of it <laughs> protruded <laughs> into the, into the, into oh, the passenger fantastic. seat. Yes. So I couldn't see where the left turning was. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I was restricted in my vision. <laughs> and I was saying to you, have we got to the junction yet? Are we, um, do I turn? And I can see you hanging out the window looking. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, Sherry, and you sketch happening in your yes, car. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, he's got this um, instructions to put it together. And we did laugh at it, although it is a bit racist, <laughs> yes. isn't it? Because yeah. he turns over the page, because he says about... Assemble, it, yeah, clips They together. finally work out how to do it, yeah. or June does it. And then he comes back and he gets the branches are in bag A and he gets yeah. bag A and he turns the instructions over and it goes from English to Spanish yeah. and then English to, I don't even know what the other, one of them yeah. is Chinese and the other one's probably French, but, yeah, I think. Terry's got doing Chinese. Doing Chinese, yes. Not something you want to see. No. Then the um, the carol singers turn up. Yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. The, the now, little boys. I yeah. thought we were heading for an archetypal um children singing badly on the on the on the doorstep but it was way more than that (laughs) it was wonderful and i'm beginning to think johnny kane had this was the way that johnny kane went around john kane went Mm. around um, doing his carol singing with his kids (laughs) (laughs) but and you said what was it you said warren about the the number of lights they've got on in the house every light in that house is on which Uh, makes a difference from because i was thinking this the other day because i have trouble reading I'm sorry in that. artificial light. <laughs> yeah. So ideally I have as many lights on as possible so that I can read if I want to. But in sure. a lot of television shows they only have like side lights on. Yeah. So it's dark in most of the room apart from pools of light because mm. obviously it, the, the the lighting people are the I think it gives it an interesting yeah. yeah. Where is this? There's lights everywhere. But they've got central lights. They've got wall lights. Yeah, they've, they've got, got lamps. lamps. They've and got they've got electric yeah. fire burning. Yeah. And 
The hallway lamps on, upstairs lights on, kitchens on, yeah. but they don't spend all their time in all these rooms. Mm, but I, again, I see. I I don't mind that because when I lived at home, we had to turn lights off as we go. We went, so you'd go to you the left bathroom. The room, yeah. You'd have you turn the hall light on. When you got to the bathroom, you just, my dad would turn the hall light off from downstairs. Then you'd have to shout and you'd turn the hall light on, but you had to turn the bathroom light off. So consequently, now I leave all lights on. Okay, as we, a bit of a rebellion. We used to have massive baker light switches. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, those? oh yeah, big round massive knobs. Thing. It's like turning the main power supply Good on and off. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it? like yeah. the monsters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we should say. Uh, Malcolm in this one is Tim Barrett. Tim Barrett. Yeah. There are three Malcolms. All right, there, are there are three Malcolms. Malcolms. The first Malcolm's Terex, Terex Alexander. Yeah. Obviously, does what and do is then goes away to do Bergerac. So they get Tim Barrett in. Yeah. Then after Tim Barrett, and I've forgotten the actor's name now. Yeah, we, we, we might see an, him in the later There's another Malcolm. There. All right. And then Tim Barrett comes back as a different character. Why do they not recognise him as Malcolm? Okay. Do you think Malcolm's been um, absorbed by some yeah, it's strange. John Quayle, that's All the right, third John Malcolm. Quayle. Anyway, we'll move on to the next uh, Christmas special in, yes. in a minute. But yeah, you, yeah. you've, you've I, taken I, to this, I, I, haven't I, you? But before this, yes. we do that, we've got the surprise. Mm. Oh. Um, so, Lisa, if you'd like to take hold of this and get okay. Warren to take... No, no, no. Oh, right, take hold of this. Right. Ooh. Okay, Warren. We've got a cracker for Warren. Oh, you're going to pull a cracker? You put a cracker live on air. Do I say pop? No, it should make a noise. One, okay. Two, three. Ow! <laughs> right, Lisa's got the. I've got. You've got the. Pro- are you right, Warren? You fractured <laughs> your elbow. I have got. I don't know what, what it's. It's that? like a bell-shaped cookie cutter, I think. The tiny cookies. <laughs> tiny, tiny cookies. Hey, hey, hat. Hey. Hey. And I've got a joke. What's they joke? They joke. My joke is: What's the fastest fish in the world? I don't know. I don't know. What, a the... motorbike. Oh, cheery me. And on that tish. note, yes. <laughs> we'll get, put your hat on. I'll put my hat on, but it'll fall over my eyes. Right, Lisa's sitting here wearing a yellow hat, and you've yes. got to keep this on for the whole okay. of the episode. All right. Okay. okay. See you soon for the next episode. Okay. Bye bye. bye. We're back again with more yeah. with more Terry and June. <laughs> yes. Uh, this time from the twenty eighth of December, nineteen eighty one. Now, there's no mm. actual episode title. No. Given. No. I would um, call it. In and out like a fiddler's elbow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, 20 past five is Grange Hill Christmas special. Mm-hmm. Uh, 5.45, K9 and company. Mm-hmm. And Christmas Terry in June is at 6.35. Yes. Followed by the Battle of Midway. Yes, because it's, 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 it's obviously <laughs> not It's not quite so much Christmas, is it? So let's just yeah, put we're, any we're old a bit, town. We're a bit after, so you've got a schedule yeah. to fill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what do you think of this one? This one's more in the like the fast line, isn't yes. it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Almost except uh, almost with Vicar with no trousers running through yeah. sex. Because it's more yeah. Malcolm and Beatty. Yeah. Yes. Except Beatty doesn't seem to have the fur coat that she had last year. No. I don't know what's no. happened to that. Perhaps it's not cold enough to wear a fur coat. But it's all about yeah. sort of Malcolm having ding dongs with mm-hmm. other yes. women, isn't yes. it? Now what do you what do we think of this? Is we're this very quite, Christmassy? Yes, we're not sure we approve of I this. don't think I'm I'm I i can not remember all this yeah. sort of thing. Oh, well, I, I remember him always being a little bit of a lecherous old pervert. Yes. <laughs> ah. Yes. But has <laughs> has as so far we're halfway through and has the subject matter surprised you a bit? Did you think it was a bit more safe than this, perhaps? I thought it was gonna be a safe comfortable terry and jude like the previous the pace has picked up a lot mm. quicker mm. yeah um the jokes are firing out quicker isn't yeah. it? uh but i thought it was a bit um a bit dodgy wasn't it well for the mm. time it's on half past six yeah you know i'd feel it we're was... talking about extramarital affairs yeah mm. i mean there's Something a lot of smoking a lot yeah. of smoking yeah. there's, there's a few more swear words well there mm. were last time actually because yes. but yeah. that was on a bit later wasn't it yeah. so. and mm. uh, a lot of, lot of drinking going on mm. as well. a lot of drinking yeah. and, and spiders and spiders spiders, spiders. arachnophobia yeah. yeah i love the fact that terry's scared of spiders yes. <laughs> well, haven't they got the wobbliest kitchen table in the oh, world yes. we're waiting for it to collapse aren't we because yeah. you, you said there's a load of Bottles of drink, like sort of Bell's mm. whiskey and gin all the and labels all that. looking mm. the other way. And all the labels you can't quite quite see on on it, screen. It's like mm. the fairy, um, sorry, the detergent plastic detergent bottle will have the white piece of tape across the bit that says fairy. <laughs> <laughs> and did you say there was a bit of a wobbly set at one point as well upstairs or something? Oh yes, well I didn't really spot where it. Where they but... do the running between bedroom scene, yeah. they slam the door and the wall wobbles like Mon- um, Monty Python, like pure faulty towers. <laughs> But yeah, 
Um, and somebody's clearly bought the uh, freeze frame machine for the video <laughs> editing suite, haven't they? Yeah. Because not only have you got a special title sequence, which is yeah. just done in, Another in slide just, just single single frame shots. Yeah. Um, so we haven't actually had the proper title sequence at all yet. No, not at all, no. no. I don't no. think we're going to get it. No. And there's another sequence to do with uh, New Year's Eve at sort of midnight, mm. um, mm. where, what was it, Beatty's kissing some bloke. Yeah. and then Servicing tonsils. More yeah, than and uh, Malcolm's not happy about it. <laughs> And then he goes to throw a punch, and he gets Terry in the mm. in the eye. So yes, but yeah, um, you can tell how this <laughs> this technology is is still quite early because uh, a lot of the shots, like all the action shots, is they're very very blurry, blurry aren't yeah. they? Mm. Yeah. Um, but I, I quite enjoyed that. It's, yes. Uh, yeah. It's uh, you it's know. Com- I think there's a there's a palpable difference between the last episode yeah. we watched yes it's, it's only, so as you say it's only a year on and they're but... very confident in their roles aren't they yeah. but then yeah. again we've yeah. had the series before this wouldn't they heavily ever after yes yeah and this is the third later. series and there's very precise yeah. timing in the sort of acting and the editing yeah because uh, well, malcolm comes in and he's all like he spent the night in his car and he's all mm. hunched over yeah. And then June's going to pull that his was head the, round. That was the painful scene, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And Terry comes in at just the right wrong, wrong yeah. moment, if you see yes. what I mean. And I think we forget how good sort of a sort of how technically good Terry Scott actually he is. He is, yeah, absolutely. He yeah. really is. His delivery is wonderful, he is. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's it's Bang spot on. on. The nail. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. great fun all round, I think. Yes. They're, they're a bunch of old pros, aren't they? Really? They are. They are they're all of... firing on. Yeah. Top whack. There's not I? too much ham. No. no, there's enough just to make it funny, mm. and we did actually laugh out loud at yeah. a fair bit of this. We did, and that yes. surprised me. Yeah, um, and a lot of cringing as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, there is. That's, that's always mm. good fun as well, isn't it? As long as it's not too bad. Mm-hmm. But anyway, do you want to do another cracker? Oh, go on then. Right. Well, if you two pull this one, and you, you have this one, Warren. So here mm. we go. Well, you and Warren should pull it because right. I've already pulled one. Warren, okay. So. Well, I'll, I'll try not to. If, yeah. All right. Here we go okay. then, Warren. One, two, three. Oh, well, that's mine then. My hand's on fire. Lisa, can you get it out for <laughs> okay, me? Okay, right, okay. Have a rummage inside it. <laughs> so, uh, right up inside my tube. Oh, oh you've oh, got. Yeah. What's oh. that? I have no idea. It might be a hair thing. It's a bendy. What is it? Well, I have no idea. It's a heart of some is, kind. Is it a wristband? Possibly. I don't know. Oh, you've got an orange hat. An orange hat. No, put me an out. An orange on hat. Me. Hang on, I've got to get. Do we think the next one will be blue then? I don't know. Can you get it on me? Whilst you're doing that, mm-hmm. can we just mention the closing sequence? Oh, yes. that was weird. That yeah, was what was really all that weird. about, Warren? Yeah. Um, Beatty had been off to Trafalgar Square. Square. She'd been given a lift by a group of people, hadn't they? Mm. Yeah. And they were the... The Pearly Caledonian Supporters Club. Yeah. And they turn up in their coach. Yeah. And they the sort of set playing and all bagpipes. And all these people in tartan and kilts yeah. come in playing the bagpipes. I noticed the bloke in, where the bagpipes goes to the top of the stairs so he can get a close-up. Yeah. Mm. Sort of winks at the camera. <laughs> yeah. And then you get a Merry Christmas oh, to all of you. Happy, happy, happy New, New Year, Year to all of, of you at home. Yeah. Just, yeah. just integrates, doesn't yeah. it? You know, yeah. It's like the, the Feast of Stephen equivalent of Terry and June. Mm-hmm. But you ready for the uh, for the joke, boys God, and girls? What is the motto? Mm-hmm. Uh, question. How do you stop a skunk smelling? Hold its nose. Correct! Hey! Well done, Warren. <laughs> Sorry. You're getting the hang of this humour. <laughs> right. When's the next... <laughs> when... falling. When's the next one, Lisa? Next one is series... Series... Oh, from 1982. 1982. So, so it's yeah. simply called... Christmas. Christmas with Terry and June. Doing, yeah. Oh, and it, it, oh dear, it involves Sir Dennis. Sir Dennis. Oh. So About time. Medford! Medford. <laughs> this is a water game from Ideal. It's hard to pick it up, but even harder to put it down. And now, for stormy waters and jaws, try to fish out what's in the jaws of the shark without removing the wrong piece, or the jaws will get you and you're out. Water games and jaws from ideal. It's Christmas time, misery and wine, and... In the spirit of the season, I thought I'd talk a little bit about a couple of the television shows that I traditionally try and sit down at some point and watch over the festive season. There's only two, really. I always try to take an hour to watch 
Too Many Christmas Trees, an episode from the first season of The Avengers that was shot on film, the fourth series made, albeit in black and white, and the first series featuring Diana Rigg as Emma Peel. After that, our annual must-see is The Blue Carbuncle, which concluded the first series of Granada Television's high-profile adaptation of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, when David Burke is still playing a vital, youthful and intelligent Dr. Watson, very much not in the Nigel Bruce mould. Don't knock Nigel Bruce, by the way. I think he's great alongside Basil Rothbone in the Universal film series of the 1940s, and that film series always gets an airing around this time of year when the world outdoors is dark and chilly. I also try and park myself in front of It's a Wonderful Life at some point too, but as it makes my beloved cry, I have to sneak that one into the machine at some point when she's otherwise engaged. Christmas is, of course, traditionally the most wonderful time of the year when it comes to telly, especially in the light entertainment department, anyway. Although over the years, the drama departments have also tended to offer festive-themed or extended special episodes of some favourite series, which may feature overseas filming, extended running times, or perhaps unexpected high-profile guest stars. When I was a kid, of course, Christmas also meant that television also started far earlier in the day than was usual, and the mornings were filled with exciting adventure series intended to keep children happy, and characters like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon were resurrected for daily runs on BBC television over the Christmas holidays, sometimes coupled with a series being rerun called Holiday Star Trek, or to keep us in impressionable kiddiewinks amused as parcels were wrapped and mince pies were baked. Episode 1 of the first Flash Gordon serial features music used in The Bride of Frankenstein and has a bear painted with stripes as an alien beast and Flash fighting three massively fanged and hairy men wearing space nappies. We were engrossed! On the big day itself, we were never allowed to have TV on during the day, apart from the Queen's speech, of course. But once we'd got home on Christmas night, the family would gather round to see some of the greats, some mothers do have them, Mike Yarwood, Eric and Ernie, and The Generation Game, editions of which still have record-smashing ratings because almost everyone else in the country was pretty much doing exactly the same thing, and almost nobody yet had a home video recorder, apart from William Shatner in that Columbo episode where he wears a big white hat. But it's none of those shows that really mean Christmas to me nowadays. Over the years I've picked up my other favourites, and they are the ones that re have really come to mean Christmas to me in more recent years. Getting back to them, it might seem surprising that an adventure series like The Avengers might try to do a Christmas episode, as these sorts of shows were generally bundled up, packaged and made to be sold off in chunks to the various networks. And unless they go national or international, that pesky little festive slot does tend to only turn up once a year, even if it is at around the same time, which makes scheduling programmes with a festive theme slightly awkward. The Avengers did have form, though, of at least being vaguely topical, and on Christmas Day in 1965, what else were you going to hang your merry tale around? Happily, with the Avengers having your story fixated around a Charles Dickens fanatic at Christmas time doesn't feel too much different to any of the other eccentric diabolical masterminds with peculiar obsessions in the series, and means that the episode doesn't feel too Christmassy even in August. I think that the black and white series of The Avengers featuring Diana Rigg as Mrs Emma Peel is my favourite overall. Being shot on film, it just makes it feel classier somehow, but the monochrome also gives it gravitas and hides a multitude of design sins. It's a great series overall, with some fabulously rewatchable episodes, and Too Many Christmas Trees, with a script by Tony Williamson and directed by Roy Baker, is from about halfway through that series, and is very much in the television tradition of creating unsettling tales for Christmas night. It begins with a dream sequence all played out to some eerie harp music, as a sleeping John Steed is transported to a cut-out studio forest of stylized Christmas trees, stars and baubles, while still in his pyjamas. Via a parcel, he finds himself a mirror and quite possibly the scariest masked Santa Claus in television history. Eventually, some Christmas stockings lead him to find a dead body. Ho, ho, ho. And it's a pretty terrifying ho, 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 too. We cut to a bizarre fairy perched upon a Christmas tree as Steed wakes up in his flat after what seems like a very rowdy night before. At his door is Milko, Emma Peel, in her finest tweeds, and over some jolly banter we discover all about his night in with the rear admiral and his recent nightmares. During this exchange, his childlike retort to Emma's suggestion that there's no Santa Claus is delightful, by the way, and remains a rather typical example of their wonderful on-screen relationship. Meanwhile, Steed shaves, requires much black coffee, and we learn that the body he saw in his dream was suspected traitor Freddy, who turns out to be actually dead. 
we cut to an aerial view of a rotating circular table of doom with added snowflake pattern where the late freddy's picture is already being replaced by the next target a certain mr john steed as pendulum swing clocks beat a soporific drumbeat and that blurry terrifying santa cackles away and whilst we ponder upon brainstorms, Steed goes through his Christmas cards and receives one from Mrs. Gale, which is a rather unusual nod to the earlier incarnation of The Avengers starring Anna Blackman, and cheekily makes reference to her role in the James Bond film Goldfinger. Perhaps because of all these women sending fondest regards to him, Steed is invited by Mrs. Peel to come away for a proper Dickensian Christmas at a house party she's invi been invited to by her friend Jeremy. And whilst we contemplate a blank Christmas card that very much resembles the elements of Steed's dreams, we find John and Emma travelling in Steed's old Bentley, of which he is very fond, along a strangely familiar route to the old dark house also very familiar from his dreams. Something is obviously afoot, because they have been invited to spend Christmas amongst a nest of spies, which includes very familiar faces like Alex Scott and Edwin Richfield, out in the middle of nowhere. At the house they are greeted by Robert James of Lesterson in The Power of the Daleks fame, playing Jenkins the butler, and meet Mervyn Johns playing the Charles Dickens enthusiast Brandon Story, and amidst dark mutterings about experiments they are shown to their Dickensian-themed bedrooms, after which they attend a party where various introductions are made, and Steed soon regains his lounge lizard credentials when he spots an unattached young woman. Edwin Richfield, as Dr. Teasel, does his level best to look sinister, never difficult for him, and much sinister noise is made of psychoanalysis and a novelty guillotine cigar cutter, which leads to John Steed having a Sidney Carlton-themed dream where a much larger guillotine threatens him, and he first meets the sinister psychic Janice Crane, yet to formally arrive at the house and played by Jeanette Sturker. And there is another round of diabolical laughter from behind that scariest Santa mask ever. Meanwhile, Steed and Mrs. Peel start to investigate in their bedrooms. Janice Crane actually arrives, leading to more questions about Steed's sudden psychic abilities. Emma's young friend Jeremy Wade, played by Barry Warren, is starting to get the twitches, which will later lead to his untimely demise, as such things tend to in The Avengers. Steed and Mrs. Peel's outfits arrive for the evening's costume party, and Steed is, not unsurprisingly, going to be decked out in the same Sidney Carlton garb that he was wearing in his ominous dream, whilst Mrs. Peel gets to wear a very tight Oliver Twist outfit, which is nice. Well, as Steed says, my, you have filled out a ham. Anyway, they go downstairs to attend just the sort of Dickensian Christmas party that many of us probably would love to be able to host, and there is much talk of Steed's potential breakdown and a hypnotic psychic display from Janice where horrible Santa gets another round of sinister laughing in, although Emma manages to break the hypnotic spell. Meanwhile, Jeremy, as Marley's ghost, fixes a date with Destiny in the rather nicely designed Hall of Great Expectations, where the statutory mice nibble at the statutory abandoned wedding cake amidst the many cobwebs. His body is found in a chair there by Emma, carrying a candelabra of real candles, health and safety fans. She uh, matter-of-factly goes to fetch Steed who is acting most bizarrely and daffy in order to resist the hypnotic mind control or whatever it is, and this leads her back to Dr. Teasel, who helps her to find Jeremy's body has now disappeared. Uh, uh, has some theories about group telepathy, is with her when she witnesses the butler drugging Steed's drink, and finally pulls a gun on her, proving that he's a wrong one we always expect him of being. But all is not what it seems. Steed pretends to sleep as Teasel is bested in a fight with Emma Peel, no surprises there, and the table folk get more confused as Steed is faking having drunk the potion, maintains it is Emma that has been showing signs of being mind-controlled, that Dr. Teasel is not a wrong one after all, and then encourages her to join him in a jaunty rendition of Green Grow the Rushes, oh, to help keep their minds clear. Their interaction here is quite lovely, bearing in mind that they'd only been together a few weeks in the television series terms, and it goes a long way towards showing why this particular Avengers pair is so fondly remembered. Anyway, it's now pretty much all over for the diabolical plotters bar the big end of episode fight in the mirror room and evil Santa getting shot. Yes, they actually shot Santa on Christmas Day, at least in some ITV re regions anyway. Only this Santa is, of course, that lovely janitor, uh, sorry, Dickens admirer, Brandon Story, unmasked in a very Scooby-Doo way. And he would have got away with it if it wasn't for this most dynamic of festive duos. Then, after a bit of nonsense with a tear gas pen, Steed and Emma Peel depart the episode in this week's mode of transport, which is a festive pony and trap, or perhaps it's a reindeer, seeing as it's called Prancer. 
As a Christmas piece, Too Many Christmas Trees does have all of the trimmings, but it's not overdone, which in certain television series is probably for the best, and I love it to bits. The Blue Carbuncle, however, is a genuine Christmassy treat and was always intended as such. This is a Sherlock Holmes tale from the pen of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and it is beautifully executed in the still truly scrumptious Del Granada series, in an adaptation by Paul Finney, directed by David Carson. Unlike much other Holmesian fare, it is a relatively light-hearted tale of a valuable lost jewel and some Christmas geese, which includes some sparkling performances from a set of lovely actors, and gives some of the finest and most memorable moments that this lavish and lovingly made series produced. From the opening credits filmed on Granada's meticulously recreated Baker Street set, they used to do tours, you know, where I immediately start to wonder how old the cheeky kids at the shop window now are. To the closing credits, this is a work of art, and this episode remains a work of Christmassy art and a must-see annual festive treat. We open on a close-up of the carbuncle, a kind of blue ruby itself, and all shiny, cut and sparkling, but within it we see flashbacks of its brutal provenance until it is presented to the Countess of Morcar in her prime. We then jump cut to her looking older and far more tired as she travels back to the opulent Hotel Cosmopolitan from another Christmas shopping spree. She is played by Rosalind Knight, an actress with whom I was once very briefly acquainted as she was a friend of a friend's mother, and her return messes up the canoodling of her maid Catherine Cusack, played by Ross Simmons, and a hotel attendant, James Ryder, played by the one and only Ken Campbell. Ryder quickly bustles out the handyman, who he has ostensibly employed to fix the gas fire, one John Horner, a reformed criminal, as played with genuine honesty by Desmond McNamara, as her ladyship returns from her ordeal by shopping to have a bath. There is a scream as she discovers that the titular blue carbuncle has been gulp stolen. Very quickly, as John Horner gazes into a shop window with Jenny, his wife, picking out the children's Christmas presents, Amelda Brown, bravely appearing with complete dedication to historical accuracy given their poverty, almost without any makeup, plays the wife. He is arrested by Brian Miller's Inspector Bradstreet, even though he claims to be completely innocent. At Baker Street, we see a lot of street business, using that expensive outdoor set very nicely, as Dr. Watson is out and about on his own Christmas shopping expedition. This is still the original David Burke incarnation of Watson, nicely played as a vital, clever and rather dry-witted soul. Holmes, meanwhile, languishes in bed, only to be disturbed by one Mr. Peterson bearing a goose and a battered bowler hat in a very nice turn from Frank Mills. The wise Mrs. Peterson has sent him to resolve the mystery surrounding these items, although Holmes' exhortations for him to put down his goose as he searches for the first cigarette of the day is an utter joy. Jeremy Brett is immediately fabulous as Holmes, of course, and all of his little ticks and movements show that he has completely embedded himself within the character. Through a flashback, we learn how Mr. Peterson came to be in possession of the goose and the hat due to an altercation the night before, and whilst Holmes struggles to remain awake, in the end, Peterson is sent upon his way with an instruction to eat the goose. Meanwhile, the Countess is ranting at the inspector, and he suggests that she might offer a reward the subsequent news story of which draws the eyes of a returning Dr. Watson and is recounted from the papers by him. Holmes, meanwhile, is regarding the simple hat and, in what is, in my opinion at least, one of the finest scenes in the series, Holmes and Watson have a contest as to what can be deduced from said hat. Watson is, of course, sceptical about most of Holmes's deductions and conclusions, most of which, of course, turn out to be spot on. Peterson returns all of a fluster because the blue jewel has been discovered in the crop of the goose he was sent off to cook, and he seems genuinely astonished at the thousand pounds reward that he now seems eligible for, although if Holmes does intend to keep the carbuncle, as he says, his payday does seem rather unlikely to actually happen. Still, the thousand pound stuff is rather nicely played, and via a swift advert in several evening papers, the plot moves on. Meanwhile in jail, as he pleads with his doubting wife that he is now on the straight, things are not looking too good for the Horners. Holmes and Watson are studying the jewel and recounting its dark history as one Mr. Henry Baker, formerly the possessor of both goose and hat, appears in response to their advert. He is played by Frank Middlemass, being basically lovely, and he confirms many of Holmes's deductions whilst being offered a replacement goose. In another flashback, we learn of the Christmas Goose Club at the Alpha Inn, which seems to be the nicest pub in the whole of London, given how they are usually portrayed in these things. The landlord seems a caring soul, and there's a genuine family feel among, amongst the regulars. 
Mr. Baker has, it seems, sold his books as a seasonal sacrifice to bring joy to those we love, or, as the script puts it, even those we have married. Frank departs, confirming the most outrageous of Holmes's deductions, and to the chagrin of Mrs. Hudson, dinner is delayed as Holmes and Watson head out for a game of Hunt That Goose. In the Alpha Inn, we discover that Mr. Windygate got his geese from the market, and Dr. Watson comically fails to get his pint. And whilst things seem to get worse and worse for the Horners, help is at hand as Holmes meets the seriously pissed-off poulterer Mr. Breckenridge at the market, and, by a little bit of subterfuge based around a fictional wager, another delightful scene, Holmes deviously finds out where the geese were from, a Mrs. Oakshot. She is the sister of Ken Campbell's ever-so-seedy James Ryder, who saves Holmes and Watson a journey by returning to harangue Mr. Breckenridge once more about the wretched geese. They intercept him, and by displaying certain information, entice him back to the web of Baker Street and his downfall. After some banter about aliases and a magic trick involving a gas lamp, tales of a blue egg and the carbuncle itself, the game is up for Mr. Ryder and his dastardly accomplice who put him up to it, the maid, and, through yet another flashback, we discover how the goose came to swallow the jewel and much hilarity ensuing over a case of mistaken goose identity. In this, Mrs. Oakshot is played by the fabulous Maggie Jones, who turned up in just about everything at some time or other, and had a very lengthy career, being rather brilliant at no-nonsense northern women. Ryder grovels his way into a remorse-filled confession, and with a cold, Get out! No more words! Get out! is sent on his way, unpunished by Holmes, who justifies his position by saying that he may have saved a soul. Then, before they manage to sit down for their cold supper as Christmas Day arrives, they remember to inform the police that Horner is innocent, and the episode closes with the Horner family reunited outside the prison in the snow. I absolutely adore this adaptation of The Blue Carbuncle, although I do also enjoy the 1960s BBC version. This is the one to which I return each year simply because it's played with such gusto and joy. This pairing of Holmes and Watson are a delight, and whilst the birds do have terrible things done to them off screen, as does tend to happen to such birds at this time of the year, it remains a lovely tale, even if some of the plotting leaves a lot to be desired if you think about it too closely. If Holmes keeps the jewel in his museum, does Peterson get his thousand pounds? Why did Ryder sneak the jewel away to hide it in a bird, only to then immediately kill the bird? How does Holmes convince the police to release Horner? Does James Ryder actually flee abroad? Why does Horner not know his children's names? Do the villains remain in the employ of the Countess? And what future did Catherine Cusack envision for herself with James Ryder? And why did she consider this oily tow rag to be a bit of a catch? Well, this matters, of course, because it's beautifully told and gives a little bit of insight into the ordinary lives and normal London folk, which is often ignored in favour of ghastly, fog-filled nightmare visions of the wretched hive of scum and villainy that those Victorian streets are often portrayed as. And now, after a sudden realisation I made in the summer, I became aware that the first episode of Quatermass and the Pit was broadcast on the 22nd of December in 1958, and therefore it now earns its place as a Christmas special in my book, and will henceforth have to occupy another slot in the annual Christmas schedule at Holmes Towers. We begin in Hobbs Lane, SW1, where location footage of a satisfyingly diverse cast finds a group of workmen uncovering some human remains as they dig the foundations of a new office building. But that's another story. Merry Christmas. Thank you very much to Mr. Martin Holmes yes, for doing you, Too Many Christmas Trees and The Blue Carbuncle. Yes, indeed. Very Christmassy uh, episodes. Indeed. Uh, now we're going to do uh, the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures from 1977. We are. As presented by Carl Sagan. Yes. Right then. Okay. Do you know all about Mars now? We know a bit more about Mars. Mm. Yes. So Carl Sagan... Know that Carl likes to throw marbles at things. <laughs> well, we're talking about that, yeah. But Carl Sagan's fourth lecture is on Mars before Viking. So uh, this is Christmas uh, 1977 stroke New Year 78. Is that because there was ten of them that they went on into the New Year? 
No, there's actually six. Oh, six? Yeah. All right. But, well, uh, however many. I would have been nine. Mm. And he says it takes you one year to get to Mars. And a year seems a long time. It does seem a long mm. time, doesn't it? Yeah. But you forget that, yeah. um, as he points out, the, it depends where Mars is. Because um, it could be 50 million miles away from the Earth, or it can be 150 million miles away from the Earth, what, depending, depending, where depending on where it is in its yeah. orbit. Yeah. Okay. And you could, unfortunately, land during the middle of a sandstorm. Well, you, <laughs> and not yeah. see anything. Not see anything. So, yeah, yeah this, is, this is all about the sort of mariner probes, as they were called, of, of the sort of 60s and early 70s. And one of the first things Carl gets out is a little model <laughs> of, the, of the spaceship, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And it's all got these wonderful things on it, like a... A satellite dish and solar panels and things mm-hmm. like that. And I was just saying to you, well, you got those on your house now. Yeah. Mm. Well, we haven't. We've got a satellite dish, but it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got a com- it's got a computer on board as well. Yeah. And I, I just love the fact that you know all this technology has become very so commonplace. Now. As a matter of fact, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, at the, at the time, this would have been exciting. Sort of, you know. Um, sort of really out there in terms of sort of technological achievement, but you know, forty years later, mm-hmm. we've all got one. Yeah, um, yeah. All this sort of Martian probe stuff is is um, directed from the Jet Propulsion Lab via radio telescopes, uh-huh. and I, I always like the thing that somewhere on the Earth there'll be a radio telescope that can be pointing at Mars. To Mars in the right direction. Point, yeah. Yeah, it's not like you're just doing it from one telescope and you can't do it for half a day because <laughs> it's, it's got sort of nowhere near it. Um, but, yes, yeah, so we're, we're talking about sort of me- meteors. Uh, meteor crater mm. is an example on Earth of the cratering you get on the Moon and on Mars. Mm-hmm. So, of course we get the first of our demonstrations and i always love the demonstrations in these these sort yeah. of things because they're quite they're quite simple mm. but it'll call upon like two or three kids well, that's the, the whole point of making something engaging isn't yeah it? From, from the audience yeah. he, he's quite a pied piper to that certain extent <laughs> isn't he and he's got a tray full of what could be putty or something i'm yeah. not entirely yes. sure what it is mm. and he gives them a load of marbles to chuck about yeah. lob them at it yeah. yeah not all of which go in the in the mud <laughs> no. you hear some hit the floor or <laughs> you can see the assistants taking cover behind desks yes. and things. Yeah, but if I was at the, one of these lectures, my hand would definitely go up to. Yeah, even if I didn't know what I was quite being called upon to do, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'd, I'd want to get involved. And you said to me, Warren, um, that you found him sort of an engaging speaker as well. Very much so. Very um, much so. So if you were in that audience, you'd pay attention. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and the hand, like yourself, the hand would be going up. Yeah. You wouldn't know what you'd be letting yourself in for, but your hand would be going up, yeah. Well, they're not allowed to do anything too dangerous. But even so, there's the old thing that I, I did wonder whether would pass sort of health and safety these days, mm. mostly involving the vo- volcano demonstration. Yes, that was so close to the um, to, to the audience, wasn't it? Yeah, because they, they, again, they, they sort of wheel on this sort of thing with... with Black powder in some Yeah, sort of... it's, it's, it's all sparks coming out of the top of it. <laughs> Great big plumes of smoke going up into the rafters. I was <laughs> waiting for him to make the comment we're about to set the fire alarms off or something like that. Yeah, yeah well, that that's the thing. I, I, I don't... I assume they had smoke alarms there but, but perhaps I, not, no, but not this is 1977 I, I really don't know probably just mm. open the vents in the ceiling <laughs> let it all out yeah but it, it's one of those things that um it would be really useful to us astronomers these days if we could observe a meter uh, a crater actually forming on the moon um because it would be it would be fascinating to see Thank you, Lisa, for turning my page. Um, but there is some evidence that um, we've talked about this before. The, yes. the 1178 mm-hmm. impact on the moon is the only sort of observed impact event in re- recorded history. Is that the Giordano Bruno, Bruno one? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and that's mentioned in Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World as well and in the Cosmos series. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to actually have some footage of it happening in real time because it would would be really helpful for science to see that happen and it is overdue i think it's about time it 
it happened. Mm. <laughs> it's a big chunk of the moon fly off. No, no, it would just you know just, just create a nice impacted sort of, round crater. Yeah, with just, a raised lip and yeah, we yeah. could we can actually see how it would it would, would happen. But he's talking about um, how craters on Mars are named after dead people. <laughs> and fortunately, <laughs> there were a lot of dead people. people are, <laughs> yes. So you've got you've got ones named after sort of Lowell, Lowell and Huxley and H.G. Wells. Mm. But as you said, Warren. Um, when the probes got there at first, it was a cloudy day. <laughs> there, was du- there was a dust storm, yeah. wasn't there? That's right. Yeah, it's like mm. going on holiday somewhere, and all it does is rain. Mm. It's 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 just a, a seaside Victorian seaside town, hasn't it? And yeah. it's an overcast day. But they've got some pictures of what eventually get called North Spot, Middle Spot, and South Spot. <laughs> Though the suggestion was they'd be called Groucho, Harpo, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. <laughs> oh, Chico, he said. I love the fact he can't quite remember all the Marx brothers. But yeah, they're saying about sort of, if you see a dark smudge with a hole in it, could it be a volcano? volcano yeah. mm-hmm. And there's the picture of Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus. Um, didn't, that, doesn't, didn't Brown Blessed want to climb Olympus Mons? Yeah. Yeah, mad fool. <laughs> <laughs> I've flown up it in Frontier Elite, the computer game, because mm. you can actually land on Mars, fly mm. about in your spaceship and go up the sides of it, and it is very tall. Mm. It had been banned by the Queen anyway. She's banned him from climbing Everest anymore. Has she? Yes. Oh, We're not that. going to climb Everest anymore, are you? I get terribly worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Olympus Mons is something like 30 kilometres high, which is much bigger than anything on the Earth. Um, there's some talk about polar caps and the sort of changes you observe them from week mm-hmm. to week and poker chips he says poker that chips, these yeah. things that resemble poker chips and what is it you said Warren? I love the fact that he assumes that kids know what poker, poker chips, chips are because they're all down the gambling den every night <laughs> um, river yeah. valleys um, sort yeah. of river valleys are on river valleys yeah yeah so is there is there evidence of running water on mars at at some time. Well, this is the question of the great question, isn't there? Yeah. Were there ever canals on Mars? And again, he gets this sort of demonstration um, involving some running water. He's sort of slightly disturbed by the sound of it. I don't know whether he yes. meant he wanted to go for a pee, a pee or, not. or not. Yeah. But he makes the point that atmospheric pressure on Mars um, is so low that water, if you put a, cup, a jug of water out, it boil would boil. Away, yeah. 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 So that's the thing in Marco Polo when they say about you go up a mountain mm. and it boils at a lower temperature, which is why you can't make decent tea halfway up a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, and talk about the, the Earth's polar caps and how they've changed over sort of millions of years. And all all of this is to do with climate change, ba- basically, isn't yeah. it? Mm. And the sort of observation that if you observe it on one planet... It's going to happen it's in happening another, somewhere yeah. else. You, you've got yeah. to be aware it's going to happen yeah. in other planets, yeah. including this one. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's and it's very not rocket science, yeah. is it? No. And for 1977, he says this in so matter of fact way yeah. that it's you know it's worrying that people still argue about it yes. to this day. Yeah. And those people somewhat can be somewhat influential, shall yes. we say? Mm. But, um, yes. Yeah. So that's uh, that's worrying that you know. I think for the sort of group of kids that were there... We'll probably remember that. We'll probably remember that. And, uh, you know, to them it's probably entirely natural, that that way of thinking. But for some people, perhaps sitting in a few more lectures might be a good idea, (laughs) (laughs) shall we say. But, yeah, there's there's all the talk about um, the temperature really plummets at night, UV light gets through. I'm surprised how far it did plummet. Yeah, oh, Mm. it gets very nippy on Mars. Yeah, more than a couple of woolly pullies there, I'll tell you. (laughs) And then in the experiment with Mars jars, as they're called. I love that idea. Mars jars, yes. So that's that's a, a vessel that would simulate the Martian Can environment. Happen, yeah. And astonishingly, some microbes do actually Still exist, survive yeah. on that. Well, it was the case, wasn't it? They're, they're various will and various won't, isn't it? Depends upon that. Mm. Then there's some talk about like Martian wind. Which made you laugh for some reason. I don't know why you laugh at wind, but um, and they get their wind machine out to blow some sand about, mm-hmm. blinding the assistant. You can't get the the um, the screen up quick enough, can't you? And uh, wind on Mars can go to two hundred to three hundred miles an hour, and produce all sorts of streaks. Um, and then it's almost like cutting through somebody, wouldn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. wind, wind. yeah. You wouldn't want to be sort of exposed to that. Definitely. And then there's a feature which. 
are sometimes called the Pyramids of Mars. And you thought that was just a Doctor Who story, didn't you? Had you actually heard of this before? I'd never heard of that before, no. 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 Well, I, I had heard of it because I discovered them not long before, didn't I? Yeah. Which influenced the title of the um, story. But that's the thing. <coughs> that's the thing that, um, you know, we've sent probes to Mars and we've got things moving about on Mars, but it's still a very big place. Yeah. And with no oceans as well, there's an awful lot of stuff to to explore and it's very very much the case you look if you've got a little machine trundling around over the next horizon is completely unknown territory oh, yeah. for example carl's talking there about one side of mars is is potted and cratered mm. and the other side as you'll see is um smooth and it's almost virgin like territory it's it's new isn't it but that, that's the thing that people sort of when they write science fiction tend to forget they they tend to think a planet is the same all the way across, oh, yeah, exactly. and and it's not. Um, even somewhere like Mars, there's an awful lot of difference from one place to yep. another. You, you you travel sort of a hundred miles, and you're in somewhere completely and utterly Absolutely, different, yeah. and that that's very very interesting. Um, but what did you make of that as a as a lecture though? Um, as a lecture, mm. I would if I was at that age group. And in the audience, I would find it highly engaging. In yeah. fact, I still find it highly engaging now. Um, he reaches out and he plants little seeds in your mind. And, yeah. in, and um, even if it's just through a, a simple practical example, you're drawn in. Like the salesman, you're drawn in, you want to know more. Yeah. Uh, I, I said to you the Pied Piper, didn't I? <laughs> because he draws his audience in and he holds court. Yeah. And... You hang on everything Carl wants to tell you. He's a wonderful orator. He's, he he delivers so much information and so much knowledge, but in that short period of time, makes me want to go go away after the lecture and go I want to read more about that. Yeah. Well, there is a book um, from the Royal Institution, Thirteen Journeys Through Space and Time, and that covers some of the other lectures. There is some stuff on Carl's one though. And um, these are the I said these are late seventy seven. These lectures happen, um, but the BBC actually write to him in a le- in a letter dated the twelfth of February nineteen seventy six. So it's the best part of two years beforehand. They're sort of <laughs> checking him out uh, about it, and he he's he wants to talk. They they want him to talk about exobiology, so biology off the earth yeah. as, as it were in space in space space biology so he suggests planetary exploration would actually give him more to talk about yeah so he sort of actually comes back and said no we should do it on on this um and i've got a a copy of his um flight ticket here um and apparently it costs 638 pounds it's mars <laughs> to get to get to fly him over um there's a le- there's a letter from uh, Sir George Porter who's the director um of the Royal Institution dated the 19th of December 1977 and I'd just like to read it out because it's 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 rather fun Welcome to London and the Royal Institution I hope the trip was comfortable and that you have a good night's sleep so that you're ready for the rigors of tomorrow <laughs> Your expenses await you at the Royal Institution and you can collect them from the bursa David Miller at any time. You will be interested to know that you have a very distinguished audience indeed for the first lecture since it will be attended by TRH, I think that's their Royal Highnesses, uh, the Prince Andrew and the Prince Edward, HRH the Duke of Kent, our President, and the Duke of Kent's oldest son, the Earl of St Andrews. Who's that? It's the Earl of St Andrews. Thank you. My wife and I are having a special tea party at 4pm after the first lecture, uh, which we hope the princes will attend and have the chance of meeting you. It will only last half an hour or so, and I have asked the BBC to see that you have no other commitments at this time. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. All best wishes. I have to say, you know, you asked me the Earl of St Andrews. I have no knowledge of that layer of royals. Oh, you're not that good. No, no, they're they're, they're sort of minor roles of... They're cousins. All so. right, but George Porter is 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 worth talking about because he did the lectures in 1969, mm-hmm. which were on time. <coughs> excuse me, which were on time. Mm-hmm. 
And if you'll just hold the recorder, Lisa. Okay. okay thank you. Yeah. Um, if I find the 1969 lectures there's, there's a letter um from george porter to the bbc about what he wants to do with his lecture on time and it's it's very faded this letter now so it's a little hard to read but he said i would however plan to have a doctor who type time machine making use of your devilish, devilishly clever camera tricks both in the first lecture and the last one so the connection will be obvious Ooh. and i've got a picture of the time machine which is basically a big box mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with a dial on it that says past, present and future. There it's it is. a little bit vague, isn't it? Yeah, and there's a, there's a sort of an assistant. Giant war machine. There's yeah. an assistant <laughs> it does look like stood a war inside machine. it. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, you can't see these lectures because these are some of the missing ones. Oh. Yes. Um, so there's been sort of some stuff um, sort of recently sort of publicising the fact that some of these, unfortunately are missing mm -hmm. so um yeah the the missing ones uh go all the way up to 1973 when there's a david attenborough one mm -hmm. for animals now there's 1966 67 69 70 and 71 um engineer in wonderland the intelligent eye time machines that's george mm -hmm. porter's one monkeys without tails Okay. It's not just about monkeys without tails. Okay. That would be a very. Okay. Yeah. It says a, can't tell stories. No, it's a giraffe's eye view of man. Nineteen seventy-one is sounds of music, the science of tones and tunes, and the David Attenborough yeah. one, mm. the language of animals. Mm. So, as the Royal Institution have, have said, um, make a search through your attic or basement to see if you've got them. <laughs> Oh, I'm very I British. Th mm. I think I think they're holding your shed. Yeah, I think they're holding mm. out. Ask your older relatives if they might have copies. Oh goodness me! What's this Betamax cassette? Spread the word about the campaign on social media using the hashtag Missing Xmas Lectures. Wow! So, it's amazing they've only just discovered this. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean you don't have all oh, of them? Look in your rarely used cupboards to see if you have a recorded <laughs> copy of any of the missing lectures. They're rarely I'm used the cupboards. Master plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's they're not only but also. Yeah, oh, there they are. I think they're a little hopeful, to be, to be yes. honest. Because what a twee British way to do things. But yeah, it? yeah. It's, all, it's all very low, low key, isn't they live it? it? They live in hope. Yes. yes. Would you mind awfully having a look in your cupboard? This is where they turn up in Sierra Leone. Yes. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's very unlikely because yes. they were ve they, they were very much just for the home market. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I certainly remember watching watching them sort of at, at Christmas I do, when yeah. I was young, mm -hmm. and they were very much part of that Christmas routine. Um, but I think the Carl Sagan ones are, are very good and still very relevant. Yeah. Um, well, eventually, the one we were watching, uh, the, the one we've, we've just seen with, with the, um, the, the the climate change. Hmm. Mm. Well, that's the thing. Watching them age nine, um, the 21st century seemed so far so away. So far away. And, you know, you were de you thought, well, when I'm 50, people will have will, will be living on Mars. You know, that that's the sort of thing you thought they that there will be bases on there and sadly it hasn't happened um and i think we need a few more people like carl sagan um giving these sort of lectures to sort of you know engage people again because yeah. um, i do get the feeling that sort of that sort of planetary exploration it happens and it still occurs but i don't think it fires up people as much as it, perhaps it should I these think days we've let technology overwhelm us hmm. With lazy, what I would call lazy technology, yeah. and lazy technology, I mean uh, the u the use to which we put the internet, yeah. or games, yeah. or something that takes us away from exploring more ourselves. Yeah. We're more happy to sit at home and look at pictures on Instagram, what have it, to do with the subject matter. Yeah. But we do not want to put that foot outside that door. And start looking up at the skies and remapping and exploring that way again. And I think we need to start go back to that, take that one f step forward, leave behind the technology that's holding us back, but use the technology that's going to be marvellous. Push us forward, look at those frontiers, and look up to the sky and go, look at this map. Let's, re let's revisit the map of, of the sky. I mean, I remember the Voyager probe mm. series, that it was going to visit Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. And that sort of... Because I, I remember 
the th- the thing that it will be every few years they'll reach another planet and we'll get data from it. Just that little bit of a um, of this huge jigsaw we have. Just that little tiny yeah. piece. Is it a piece of sky? Is it a piece of land? And and, and and that sort of, I you know yeah. I I remember looking forward to the next planet. You know, in like five or six years time, and sort of I remember being at sort of sixth form reading astronomy magazine about. I think it must have been sort of Uranus or something or wherever they reached by, by that point. And um, th- thinking back to, you know, w- when I remember these sort of being talked about all those years ago. So I think that's, that's, that's lovely. The way it, it, it sort of had, it was a thread through sort of your, your life. And we don't really have a project like that going now. No. Well, you know. Unfortunately now, if it doesn't make uh, government's money... No. They don't do it because there was. There's been a lot of stuff in the press recently about the. Um, I think it was a leader of Ofsted or something like that. That said about that ultimately people that do arts degrees mm. are wasting their time right. because it's not necessarily going to provide them with a job. But th- lots of people pointed out that if you don't have people doing arts degrees, we won't have people making films or painting pictures or making television programs and it's the same with science if we don't have people doing science things we won't discover these things do you think we suffer them for the fact that nasa's had its its budget sort massively of cut. crippled has it yes. almost destroyed yeah. because we don't go to the moon anymore no. right which is great because let's look a bit further beyond however um there's nothing to stop us going back to the moon and working from there but i i think to a certain extent, the political message, and I'm sorry to make it politicised, is uh, stay at home, let's not expound, ex- expand our boundaries. But there's a heck of a lot of knowledge out there to learn. Let's go out and learn it. The politics be damned. We're, <laughs> we're a natural race to want to go out and learn. Let's, 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 broaden, let's broaden our knowledge. Well, that's the thing. I mean, this is very much, you know, we did Star Trek the other the other issue the other issue and star trek was very much that thing about exploring the universe wasn't it that you know there's a there's a lot out there to learn um and just by going out there that that exploration itself is is a, is a good thing i think by by the exploration it shows how petty our squabbles are down here on earth and the more that you can highlight that the more that perhaps we can deal with it a lot easier yeah. Oh, and we're all made of stardust. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> the old mm-hmm. Carl thing. But yeah, lovely to see him again. Yes, oh, uh, and it's um, it's amazing because I, you know, when I first watched Cosmos, you sort of get hooked up on his accent. Yeah, because it's a, quite a strange accent. Mm. But it's amazing how quickly you just listen to what listen he's to saying, what he's not, saying not and how not he's how he's it. saying it. Yes, yes. yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, these are all online on the Royal Institution website, so you can watch them. Mm-hmm. Um, for free well worth doing yeah, yeah. they're from s- some slightly shonky vhs copies <laughs> by the look of it but you can't have everything no but yeah well worth seeing and uh, well worth spending some time with i think yes. oh. okay thank you for introducing me to those that's all right okay. bye 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 ideal presents for all the family this christmas from bbc videos the very best in entertainment monty python's flying circus the fascinating life on earth series and the award-winning Box of Delights. There's festive music on BBC records and cassettes with the magical voice of Alec Jones. Experience the unique sound of Eric Clapton from the series Edge of Darkness. Or just sing along with the EastEnders. Enjoy a good read with BBC books, including the spectacular Kingdom of the Ice Bear, The Triumph of the West, and from a new natural history series, The Living Isles. Videos, records and books. Something for everyone this Christmas from the BBC. Paddington. Yes. At Christmas. At Christmas, sort of. Well, you've got a DVD with, what, 12 episodes on it, which claims to be... Yes. Um, Christmassy type episodes. Yes. Well, it says Paddington's Christmas. Yeah, and of those, three are Christmassy at a stretch. Yeah. Well, two are Christmassy. One's got one's snow got in snow it. One's got snow in it. Yeah. And we tend to have yes. snow after Christmas. We do. Don't we? If we get snow at all. Yeah. Yeah. Last last this year, rather. Yeah, we, we, we had snow had in snow. March, didn't we? So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the first episode on the disc. Mm-hmm. Is simply called Christmas, yes. broadcast on the 29th of December 1976, taken from the book More About Paddington, 
1959. Yes. And Paddington, it's his first Christmas. It's his first Christmas with the Browns. Yeah, and yes. he wakes up and yeah. his, his sack is sort of it's, filled it's, with... His, his pillowcase, which <laughs> has been told to have the other his bed. Stop laughing at the word sack. You used it for that purpose. Yeah, um, yeah the... the um, uh, what is that meant to be on that place? Sorry, we've got the episode running that in the background. That was his turkey. Yeah, but what's the white stuff? Is it mashed potato? I suppose it's so. not like we'll, meringues. We'll deal with that in a minute. Um, yeah, anyway, he's... He gets three he presents. He gets three presents in his pillowcase. Yeah. Um, a chemistry set, which is just asking for trouble. If I you had a chemistry set. We'll talk about that in okay. a minute. Um, a xylophone. Yeah. And... Ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yes. And a scrapbook. Yeah. yeah. And he gets glue for the scrapbook and manages to glue Mr. Brown to the floor. So, as you said, it's a noisy thing, yep. a sticky thing, thing, and a thing that might blow up the house. <laughs> yes. Although, I have I have to be fair, mm-hmm. chemistry sets that you could buy in the 70s yeah, were weedy. Would, would, would not blow up the house. Right, okay. I had one, mm-hmm. and yes, you had a little tiny burner that you put mm-hmm. sort of paraffin in or something like okay. that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you had things like sort of sodium thiosulfate and, yeah. and, and sort of stuff like that. But there was nothing that would, could cause an explosion. Okay, are we standing on his head now? Because I think he swallowed... He said there was a bone in the Christmas pudding, mm. and it was a five pence. And you think they think he swallowed the five pence, so they're doing what Brunel did when he swallowed a coin, a coin and standing on his head. Well, he yeah. didn't actually stand on his head; he, he invented a machine to shake the coin out, <laughs> didn't he? But I, I love Paddington's xylophone because mm. he like plays the national anthem. Yeah, he's very, he's a very patriotic bear. <laughs> it doesn't sound like the national. anthem. It doesn't anthem really sound like the national anthem. Perhaps it's the Peruvian national anthem. I don't know. He does come from darkest Peru. I was going to say, we've had a few listeners in Peru. We have. Yeah, we according have. to our Yes, it stats. keeps saying it's Aunt Lucy listening to the Paddington stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it's just interesting the way that these sort of three vaguely Christmassy ones, as you, as you say. Mm-hmm. Um, Trouble at number 32 is the one with the snow. Yes. And that's broadcast on the 23rd of December. Yes. But Paddington and the Christmas Shopping mm-hmm. is actually broadcast on the 5th of May, 1976. Yes. So, it, it's an awful, if you actually watch them in order, yeah. there's an awful huge gap between, between him going yeah. Christmas shopping and... Yeah. Uh, and, and Paddington starting his Christmas shopping very early. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I suppose it's sort of, you know, yes. being, being on the ball, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but... We should talk about the animation. We've talked we about, Paddington we talked about Paddington before. The way yes. that Paddington's 3D and everybody else is 2D. Two day, yes. But now, we've just done our Christmas tree, haven't we? Have we have today, yes. And Martin Holmes has been very kind enough mm-hmm. to provide us with um, some 2D Christmas decorations yes. based on you, me, Warren. Paul and Warren. And Warren, yes. <laughs> How does it feel to be a Christmas decoration? Slightly odd, but... A- as yeah. though you were, like, yeah. sort of Mrs Bird or yes. something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, we've, mm-hmm. we've put those up. So let, let's just uh, let's just bung number, you, Trouble you sh- at number 32 on. You should have put Play on. All on, shouldn't you? And it would have I should have done, but mm. never mind. Trouble at number 32 is the one where it snows. Yes. Um, and Paddington's alarmed because he looks out the window and comes downstairs. It's gone white outside because obviously he comes from Peru, yeah. and not, you probably don't get snow in Peru. You probably do on the mountains, but probably he's, not where he comes. He's from. not seen snow before. But I do think of like when our cats see yes. snow, yeah. and I don't know whether they remember it from year to Possibly year. Possibly not. Or no, or no. <laughs> I really don't know no. how they. Yeah. sort of minds work normally what happens with the well not so much with rose rose will go out in the snow martha tends to be carried outside carried around the garden and Show, then bought, shown, it. shown the snow and brought back in again does she not even get a feed no right? no it's like there's a picture on the internet which is it's, just, it's like the cutest um cutest point about going out to snow and it's just a footprint and like no <laughs> <laughs> wasn't there a thing about ducks the other day yes a yes, load of was, ducks they, came They out. came out of a shed and it was snowing and they went, oh no, and it went back in again. It was very sweet. But yeah, Paddington's going to clear the sort of garden. Of... Yes, he's clearing the garden. He clears the I like front. his scarf because yeah. he's got a red and red yellow and scarf. scarf on yeah. as though he were like Tom Baker yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, he's clearing the front garden out from Mr. Brown so with, we can get his car with out. With a tiny spade that with you the take down the beach. Spade, yeah. And then he's going to clean the back garden out. And then he thinks he'll be nice and call it, clean Mr. Curry's garden out. I don't know why, because Mr. Curry's never nice to him. 
Mr. Carey takes advantage of him all the time. How does his fence work? I don't know. It's sort of got a he, sliding he, panel. He, he, yes, yeah, there's a bit yeah. of the fence that you can yeah. pull up. And it's like can a go, secret entrance. Because we could do with that. With, we could. With, cause we could. Because our, our gas and electricity meters are on our wall, but it's in our next door neighbour's garden. Yeah, so we have to go round to next door and yeah. say, can we re- take a meeting, a meeting for our reader? <laughs> 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 Can we take a reading for our meter? Yes. I don't know what our reader is, but um, yeah, but we don't need to now because no, we've got a we've got a smart meter, a smart meter. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Paddington sort of goes next door and sort yes. of offers to clean up. Well, he doesn't offer; he just well, he does just it. does it. He just does it. Yeah, and then he sees that Mister Curry's door is yeah, so he shuts the door because he does then, want the cold air getting inside. Yeah, so Mister. So- C- yeah. Curry gets immediately locked out, out, yeah. and stuck in his own garden. Yes. But he deserves it because he's mean. You're not keen on Mr. Curry no. then? Not no. in this version. No. No. In the films, Peter Capaldi obviously plays Mr. Curry, and he's slightly grumpy and a little bit um, obnoxious. Mm. But basically, he's got a good heart because in the first film, he, he makes the anonymous phone call, doesn't he, to save Paddington after he's been kidnapped? Hello. Bearnapped. It's an anonymous phone call. It's Mr. Carey. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, um, what, what have we got now? Uh, well, we're still in trouble at number thirty-two. At I moment. know, but we don't. We don't need to do a DVD commentary. Yeah. Right, Next one's uh, Chris Paddington and the Christmas and shopping. The Christmas shopping. Now, that's quite good because mm. it's um, it's in some sort of posh. Yes. It's, store, it's isn't sort of it? the Paddington World version of Harrods or Selfridges or something. Or isn't Grace it? Brothers, or Grace frankly. Because yeah. it starts with Paddington goes. He, he goes. And he, he, he gets a tie pin up his ass. Yeah, well, he, he goes in and gets chucked out because he goes in the doors because they've got revolving doors and he goes in too quickly. When's comes the back last out time we went in revolving doors? Wasn't it that wasn't the last Panopticon? Time. There was one Panopticon, yes, and it was. They, they were the. They, that was they were the, the doors that moved. The, the you had to, yes, you had to get in, with, sort of go with the flow, didn't you? Because when so, we went with yeah. Sheardy for yes. lunch... Yes, he, he, <laughs> he sort of steered me in, didn't he? Oh. <laughs> yes. I remember that. Yeah, mm. well, you were a bit unsure about yeah. those doors. Yeah, well, they move! <laughs> <laughs> Did you imagine like, sort of getting trapped in the revolving yes. doors with Sheard? Yes. Um, but... <laughs> Because we had to keep going in and out because yes. we had to go to like, was it what was the shop across the road? Uh, it was a Marks and Spencer because they had cheap sandwiches. Yeah, because it was yes, as you say, it was a Hilton. It was in London. It was really expensive. And by Sunday afternoon, people were just blatantly walking in with Marks and Spencer's bags full of sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but oh yeah, we're on to the next episode now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of did think of it as Grace Brothers because mm. they've got very posh assistants who I did think of mm. as. Uh, Captain Peacock. Or oh, something. like yes, floor walkers. Floor isn't walkers. It? That's, yeah. what, that's what they're yeah. called. And basically, he goes in there to buy Mrs. Bird an extend, expandable or extending washing line. Yeah, which seems a very expensive place to go. Now it says, for a washing a, it line. says there's a hundred yards. Yes, of, uh, of washing. washing line in this box, yes. and I don't believe that for a moment mm-hmm. because you see the size of the box. Yes, and. Um, no, unless it's dimensionally transcendental, I don't believe it at all. Um, but it's that thing that it's that old sort of polite mm. store thing. Yes, that the customer is always to be called sir, sir isn't yes. it? And especially yeah. if he's wearing a diamond yes. tie pin, tie pin, which he is because he's found it outside in the street. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, he immediately sort of ends up in the crockery department, yes. doesn't he? Yes. And there's just like sounds of of, of crashing, crash. and you're like, oh goodness, because <laughs> he basically takes the washing line and he's pulling it to see how long it is, yeah. and then he just gets it wrapped around everything, yeah. people, doors, <laughs> crockery, everything. But eventually, yeah. he runs into the owner of the yeah. of the, of the tie, tie pin, pin yeah. who's like Lord or Sir or so, whatever he is. Did it not say on the... It doesn't say on the, li- on the list now. We'd, yeah. have to, we'd need the subtitles we'd, to see Well, it. I don't think it's got subtitles. Have you got, have you got the, the book? I've got the it's story, based yes. On, Let me just see. Uh, Paddington and the Christmas Shopping. Yes. Also for more about Paddington. More about Paddington. Yes, hang on. There we are. Paddington and the Christmas Shopping. I'm just okay, there you go. It. There's so, some nice pictures nice. of Paddington with his... Yes. Uh, 
With his duffel coat on. With his bits on. So, right. It's remarkable how long these stories are, They though. are quite long, yeah. Uh, oh, he gets a bullseye in a bloke's he ear, doesn't he? a bullseye he? in the assistant's ear. He's sucking on a bullseye. A bullseye. And that made me think of Sergeant Cork. He likes bullseyes. Does he? All yeah. right. So, so Pen- you're saying that like Paddington and Sergeant Court would get on well together? I think they would. Yeah. Okay. So. But yeah, who's who's the owner of I'm the? I'm just trying to o- find it. I type- don't think this is actually of the type in now. No, no, it's not. That's an extra. It just says it's. Um, so Gresham Gibbs. So Gresham there you go. Gibbs. I think they might change the name now. But yeah. I don't know. But, <laughs> but yeah, as as a sort of um, typical padding Paddington episodes go. Yes. Um, Okay, we've moaned that the set isn't necessarily uh, the sort of the fullest no. Christmassy sort of package in the world, but you do get some season two ones as well. You do, and I, I probably have seen them, but I don't remember because it's a different title sequence, isn't it? Which is the Adventures of Paddington. Yeah. Um, so the the original series runs nineteen seventy six, and then the second season runs uh, nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty. And right, I said okay. to you, you can spot. How it's changed mm-hmm. in uh, you've got a new title sequence because it's all to do with his like suitcase, yes. isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, but they do sort of it looks slightly more expensive, it does because you get it camera does. moves, yes, on sort of animated shots of Paddington. Mm-hmm. Is it like the camera pulls back yeah. or zooms in? Yeah. So. I don't know if they've used a different bear as well. His face, he looks does a look different. Bit different, yes, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. But I suppose it's like sort of three, four years later. So yes. maybe he would look different. Yeah. I don't know. It's almost as though he's like, he's aged. He's maturing. Yeah. Aww. So, yeah, he, he is that little bit, hmm. that little bit older. Because the, uh, um, yeah, the the last episode is Trouble at, Trouble at number, no, sorry, is Christmas, 29th of December, 1976. Mm-hmm. And then the new series starts again in uh, October seventy nine. Okay. So yeah, if you, mm. if you sort of you know do take it seriously, he's, he, he's he aged is, by about he two is years. Effectively three years older, Aww. so that does allow for him yes. to be different. But yeah. and we do have a Paddington. We have a we have I have various Paddingtons. Yeah. Got a um, a film Paddington, two film Paddingtons. A standing up Paddington Wellington Boots who's actually fallen over at the moment. I really must stand him up. Yeah. And a BBC Paddington, which is, is the, the version we've been looking at. Because yeah. he's BBC Paddington's got a black hat and all the others have red hats. Okay. So There is a difference. Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes. There's Paddington at Christmas then. But yes, I mean, not especially Christmassy, but it's it's 60 minutes of fun with Paddington getting sticky and... and um, various other adventures. So, what more could you want? Yeah. Okay. See you for something else. Then. Okay. A reminder that we've entertainment all night long with the contemporary video sounds from the music box beginning at twelve thirty-five. First, though, we music for Christmas. Hi there, I'm Crazy Ben Baker from Crazy Ben Baker's Books, and I positively, absolutely, totally, emphatically got a book for you. It's... <clears throat> no, 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 I'm sorry, that, that's making my skin hurt. Hello, I'm Ben Baker, and I'm very bad at promoting my own material, as evidenced by this awkward gap here. <clears throat> Moving on. Who am I? Well, I'm an amiable British chap in his 30s from the north of England who writes books and almost never annexes the Sudeten land in his spare time. Sometimes those books are quiz collections, and at the moment I have four on general knowledge, TV, pop and film, and sometimes I write about retro telly. One book, Kill Your Television, is my personal love letter to the forgotten and never remembered in the first place, with articles on the likes of Round the Bend, Lost Pilot Episodes, the 8.15 from Manchester, number 73 in the best Saturday morning shows. Dying on your ass with comic relief. Rita Rudner. Russian daytime TV. The Paramount Channel and its teletext service. DJ Cat. And even Benny Hill's madcap chase with ZX Spectrum. But today I'm here to lightly plug my book, Festive Double Issue, 40 Years of Christmas TV. As the Radio Times homage cover suggests, it's my personal tribute to all things televisual and Christmassy from the past, with a red pen in one hand, waiting to ring all the best shows in your TV magazine of choice. 
personally for me, I do always choose the Radio Times, even though, as we all know by now, it costs £78.30 an issue and has the same bloody drawing of the snowman on it from last year. Because, ah, ah, it's Christmas, isn't it? It's Christmas, mate! It's gone mad! Just have fun! I mean, I mean, Christmas invariably does mean excess, be it food, drink or television. Whether it's Markham and Wise recreating Singing in the Rain, the Trotters dressed as the dynamic duo, or EastEnders running over a bear before light relief, TV is our very pal throughout the entire turkey and tinsel period. And my book pays tribute to 40 years of festive programmes, with over 250 of them viewed and reviewed in mini-essays. Alongside the classics, there's also room for retro oddities and forgotten favourites. Who remembers Kid Creole and the Coconuts ITV musical about racism? Or... BBC One's terrifying screeching Pinocchio puppet. Perhaps you remember Roland Rat going to Switzerland. Or Skeletor learning the true meaning of Christmas. Doctor Who's original spin-off. The Bee Gees teaming up with Frankie Howard for a medieval musical comedy. Or Fergal Sharky having a nightmare on a Concorde while the Crankies watch on in helpless amusement high above the telecom tower. It's all in there, plus much, much more. But don't take my word for it. Here's one satisfied customer reading out a favourite entry from it. Wednesday, 22nd of December, 1965. 5.50pm, The Magic Roundabout, BBC One. A film series from France, episode 39, Roundabout Christmas. How much does that simple five-word introduction undersell the joy, humour and personality of Eric Thompson's wonderful reworking of Serge Dano's French animation, La Manège Enchantée? Sadly, Awkward's right tell means, other than the odd but wonderful spin-off Dougal and the Blue Cat, the Magic Roundabout has yet to grace DVD and probably never will. Which is a crying shame, as some episodes only ever seemingly aired once and deserve to be rediscovered by another generation, who probably only know the characters from novelty retro pencil cases and, hopefully not, that dire 2005 CGI film. The two-disc version DVD of which did feature some black and white Magic Roundabout episodes as extras, but I'm still sulking anyway. Even Nigel Planer's fun revival, co-written with his brother Roger for Channel 4 in the early 1990s, seemed to fall but vanish from the face of the planet. A shame for kids of all ages. I've always been slightly obsessed with TV listings, and even used to make my own fantasy telly magazines as a kid that I'd have to hide from my dad, who was already convinced I was watching too much television as it is. Maybe I wrote these books in order to somehow alleviate that goggle boxery and move it into the very important research category in my head. It was a joy, though, to go through all those old TV and Radio Times issues and find out what had made audiences in the past thrill, swoon and shout, I don't like this, what time's Boone coming on? Indeed, it's that last feeling that I wanted to also represent in the book, in order for it to not become some mad Brexiteer, things are better in 1976, even though I wasn't even born till 1980, style diatribe. The fact is, there's always been rubbish programmes on, and the aforementioned joy of going through the Radio Times with a red pen is to wheedle out the gems from amongst the soaps, treks and comedy screeching Irishmen in a frock. Wednesday 26th December 1973, 4.30pm, HMS Pinafore, ITV. Gilbert's witty class satire with Sullivan's glittering music performed by the Doily Cart Opera Company. Blimey, Gilbert and Sullivan performed on ITV in Tipping Point Slot? What next? The Flintstones on Ice? Friday 26th December 1975, 1pm, The Flintstones on Ice, ITV. Oh, seriously? A CBS production for Christmas 1973, this had animated wraparounds featuring the original voice cast of The Flintstones, but the modern Stone Age family had come a long way since their respected primetime sitcom of the early 60s. Initially making their way on Saturday mornings in 1971 with the Pebbles and Bam Bam Show, a spin-off featuring the teenage children of Fred and Barney who naturally had their own rock band, before the Flintstone Comedy Hour took its place with those ghastly fake laugh tracks that seemed ridiculous in an animated programme, especially one that wasn't very funny like this. So, I'd like to wish Lisa and Andrew a very Merry Christmas and thank them for giving me this little slot in which to curtsy and show off my wares like an old-timey street peddler. All right, lady, come and get your lovely critiques of Satan and Greaves' Boxing Day special. And if you're interested in any of my books, visit www.benbakerbooks.co.uk or if you'd like to see my blog, it's at tvlookback.blogspot.com where I also talk old telly and post episodes of my far inferior podcast, The Ben Baker Quiz Explosion. And remember, a book is for life, not just for Christmas. 
Though, to be honest, I'd just stick with turkey. Merry Christmas! If you need to find a dentist in a hurry... Christmas line for Holiday Monday on BBC One. At 5.20 at Grange Hill Christmas Special as staff and pupils prepare for an end-of-term disco. Oh yeah, what about the music? Oh, we thought you were going to do your uh, initial test bit again, sir. Uh-oh, I've retired. Well, isn't there a school group we could use? At 5.45, Elizabeth Sladen stars in K9 and Company. Where are you from, K9? From the doctor. From the doctor? I bet I did. At 6.35, Christmas Terry and June. What kind of punch are you making? The old favourite. Not Grandad's paint stripper again. <laughs> At 5 past 7, Battle of Midway, film drama in the Pacific of World War II. If you send our carriers into a Japanese ambush, the entire West Coast and Hawaiian Island will be wide open for invasion. Uh, At 10 past 9, Bell sings Bing. Only Fools and Horses, starring David Jason, Nicholas Lindhurst, and Leonard Pierce. Entertainment for Holiday Monday on BBC One. There are subtitles to our next programme on CFAX, page 170. Now on BBC One, receiving its first showing on British television, the most celebrated movie in Hollywood's history. Winner of ten Academy Awards with an all-star cast headed by Clark Gable and Vivian Lee as the Timeless Lovers. Part one of Gone with the Wind. June! June, Medford! He doesn't do that <laughs> at all. No. June Whitaker does. But now we... <laughs> June Whitaker. <laughs> Who's June Whitaker? <laughs> She's David's sister. Right. We've got a bit overexcited. We've got too much <laughs> Christmas. We've overdosed on T and J. Hey, oh, listen. <laughs> Christmas with Terry and June. 24th of December, 1982. Mm-hmm. So Dennis sort of invites himself <laughs> around <laughs> yes. Christmas Scotch. Day. And <laughs> Miss Fennel comes along and Malcolm and Beatty yes. and... And I've decided it's quite brave of them to have such an unlikable character in Malcolm because he, he's just miserable the whole time, oh, isn't just, he? Yeah. He's well, he's miserable yeah, and, he? and sort of perving over birds, isn't yes. he? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. there's a couple of crackers with big... In the... In trays. Yeah. What, what they're going to be... <laughs> in the executive board In the boardroom. Yeah. 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 That never happened in Grace Brothers. No. Uh, but, yeah, um, so this is... Obviously, the first Christmas special we see Sir Dennis, but mm-hmm. he's, he's in more episodes. He's in course. series, yes. Um, but you get to see a bit of his sort of character background, don't you? About mm-hmm. his about his wife. Yes. Yes, his late his, wife. His late wife. His, his, late, his she late, was, ugly wife. She was very ugly, and Terry says she can't be that <laughs> ugly, ugly, and not... looks at the picture and pulls a face. Yes. Like t- only Terry Scott can do. <laughs> yes. You said it's a bit of a sort of Captain Mannering moment. Oh isn't yeah, it? that yeah. moment yeah. and goes. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and then t- to me one of the highlights is actually Miss Fennel yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and her line up of films she's trying to yes. get in what, what does she watch I mean what was it Emmanuel and the ba- um, Bangkok sl- slave girls <laughs> something like that I don't know what it was but yeah they're doing charades <laughs> and uh, there's a reference to give us a clue isn't yes. there yes yeah. um, you know Actually referencing ITV stuff. Mm. That's, mm-hmm. that's not right. Um, it's a bird. No, no, it's a book. But, but <laughs> you, were sa- you were saying that it's, it's this sort of comment on sort of middle class suburbia mm-hmm. for all the like drink driving that's oh, employed yeah. to go on. It, and it? alcoholism. They're all yeah. raging. Because Terry's in the office mm. yeah. and Sir Malcolm... Sir Malcolm? Sir Malcolm. Sir Malcolm. Sir Dennis <laughs> uh, pours him an enormous... Yeah. Sc- Full glass of whiskey. So right to the top of the tumbler. <laughs> and then, how does he get home? Yeah. Cause yeah. Because June, June says she's got the shopping up. in the car. Yeah. yeah. But then she she sends him off shopping once she, she finds out. And she goes and have a few sherries, yeah. doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. So who's going to drive? Yeah. And then, um, when Sir Dennis turns up, he's got a crate of scotch, basically, yeah. hasn't he? Yeah. And it's, what, at least six bottles of... What was it Buchanan? I think yeah. it was. Yeah, but yeah. They, they kept the brand name on it, didn't they? Mm. Yeah, for once. Well, yeah. I probably made it up. 
And I do yeah. like the bit with um, because Terry starts stamping on the floor. Yes. He? And you said, "What's he doing that for?" And it turns out their Christmas tree's got a dodgy connection. On the lights, the lights have got a dodgy connection. But yeah, if you hit the uh... the right. <laughs> I think you've just hit the right one there. Shall I stamp on the floorboard? Does he yeah. do anything else? If you hit the if you hit the right bit of the floorboard, the lights go on. <laughs> do you laugh at me? Also, has he got colic? Yes, yeah, it's because we've been laughing so much. Yeah, this is yeah. generally a result of laughing at Terry. Terry Jew, Jew. Which... and they've been belly laughs in some places. I honestly they? didn't think we'd no. have this much fun. No. We're doing it. We've, we've, we've done three now, and yes. I'm almost sad that we've only got one more left to yeah, do. But... Oh, we should say about the lineup. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you were saying about the stamping, though, because the, oh, yes. the yeah, bit you were actually going to talk about is so Dennis gets cramped, doesn't he? <laughs> so right. he stands up and stamps his foot. But of course, every time he stamps his foot, he turns the light off. So Terry has to get up and stab. And it's just really yeah. silly because they're both stamping at slightly it's different Russian paces. It's almost dancing, isn't <laughs> yes. it? <laughs> yes. And I do like the bit where Miss Fennell loses her novelty under the yeah. table. Are you just looking for it? Oh, the whole I've time. lost my novelty. And what, what was it that Malcolm says? You lost <laughs> that years ago. Yeah. Oh, that was a Dennis. Oh, that was a Dennis. She's, yes. you, you pointed out, Lisa, she's got a cheap hat. She's got a yeah. cheap yeah. paper hat. She's got hat. a paper hat. Everybody Which... else has got sort of little proper hats. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that's because she was the secretary? Well, unless they've like sort of used up some old crackers. Yeah. yeah. Like we have today. <laughs> yes. And what's it... Um, What's the thing that June's got? <laughs> the thing with like some rings on. The... Oh, one of those little games. Oh, yeah. games. Sort of... yeah. We haven't got a game yet. No. We will have no. to do our crackers in a minute. Yes. Um, yeah, so Dennis. <clears throat> so, De- so Dennis? Yes, that's right. Uh, does, <laughs> does his wonderful um, sort of rambling yeah. <coughs> toast speech. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Terry has, has to sort of answer in return. Yes. Oh, but, Terry's outfit. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Terry's yeah. outfit. He's, yeah. Now, what is it? He's got his. His red cardio, yeah, yeah. sort of um, button up job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got a little bow tie on. Yeah, and then he's got a medallion. Saint mm-hmm. Christopher medallion, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's... So <laughs> I'm just, it's a very <laughs> weird combination. I don't know what style he's got, but um, yeah, this is the twenty fourth of December, um, eighteen oh five. The Kids International show. Yeah, that can off. Uh, Twenty thousand mm-hmm. leagues under the sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christmas with Terry and June. What's on before Christmas with Terry and June? Twenty thousand leagues under the sea. Oh, That's right, where they okay. buried the Genome's got, genome's oh, got duplicated yeah, posts for some up, reason. If yeah, you yeah. if you scroll right to the top, it says we're aware that the listings on this page are duplicated and are working to resolve this problem. Okay. Well, yeah. It's quite easy to resolve. Yeah. Twice the fun. Mm. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Um, so yeah, Terry and June. Um, but Terry Scott's actually on twice this evening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because after the main news, mm-hmm. oh yes I am, oh no you're not. Um, it's a look at um, Widow Twanky, Mother Goose, the Ugly Sisters, mm-hmm. and John Inman and Terry Scott are stripped down to their bloomers. That actually looks quite interesting. Yeah. I wonder if that still exists. Ooh, look who the commentaries by. Yeah, Prunella Scales. Prunella Scales, yeah. Scales. yeah. Right, and nice. Arthur Askey's in it as well. Uh, never mind. The late Arthur Askey. <laughs> the late Askey. Arthur Askey. Late. I better get a watch. <laughs> oh, and what was <laughs> what was this film they were going to watch after? I don't know. We'll see what, after the Queen, see what film was on. After the Queen's speech. It might have no um, sort of relevance at all. Yeah, so they watch the Queen's speech. We presume it's on BBC One, don't we? Well, because he says about BBC, doesn't he? International Velvet. Okay. Right, that (laughs) was, that's not the first showing of that. (laughs) That sounds a dodgy film as well. (laughs) Oh, he's off again. I don't think it is. Have a hack. hack. (laughs) And I don't think we need to go into the rest of what's on that Christmas Day, Lisa, look. not that one, but Paul Paul Daniel's Magic Show. Christmas Magic Show. You may like it or you may not. Last of the Summer Wine. Or Mod Cond. Two, two Ronnie's. Ronnie's Christmas show. Yeah. And their special guest, David, David Essex. Okay. And then Death, Death on, on the, the Nile. Nile. Oh, it's God. all a laugh on Christmas Day. And the Signal Man. Yeah. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, they, 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 really good, that. Yeah. And Christmas yeah. Night with the Spinners. All yeah, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's three down. Yes. So we've got a pool of cracker. Yes. Yeah. 
Now, Warren, let's hope you don't lose your novelty here. Yes, don't lose your novelty. If you want a grasp hold of this, Warren, yeah, have a good old pull. All right, ready? Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, blimey. Oh, it did snap. <laughs> did right. go bang. Did bang. Go bang. bang. Yeah. Do you want to pull my thing is, that goes bang? This is, well, not really. It doesn't burn my fingers. This is Warren's hat, because he doesn't have a hat, so... Yeah, well, don't you, have a hat. You've got a red hat, or is it oh, a pink oh, hat? Where's his novelty? Oh, it's coming. Oh, no, look. No, it's pink. Oh, Oh. Hang on, no, it's, it's it's a big novelty. It's stuck. <laughs> no, <laughs> can you get not get me novelty out? Wait, say grasp it firmly it's, it's with both. Oh, how disappointing! Tray. I got a Christmas tree cutter. And you got to read your jacket. It's a cookie oh, cutter God. again. Oh, nice. um, come on. <laughs> oh, you want me to read it out loud? <laughs> oh, right. Using right. words. Using how them. do ducks like to round off a meal? What? How do Ducks like to round off a meal. I don't know. Cheese and quackers. Oh. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, mm. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Christmas with Terry and June from. Is it? It's not called Christmas with Terry and June. Well, it's, it's Christmas it's, with it's June called, and Terry. Yes, it's called, it's called a pantomania. Pantomania. Mm. Yes. From the twenty fourth of December, nineteen eighty five. Yes. And it's on. Late at night. Well, yes. I say late at night. It's on nine o'clock. Yes. Yeah. And it really doesn't deserve that slot. No. There's nothing no. in there that could be possibly uh, offensive to anybody. What? My, apart from the lack of comedy, of course. Lack of comedy in the fact that they attack a cow with a large knife. With a large knife, yes. Yeah. Now, we yes. noticed a real difference with this one, didn't we? Because yeah. we were saying right at the start, we said to you, Warren, we're going to do Terry in June. And you went, oh, all right. It's not going to be that funny. If you'd have shown this one first to me. Yeah. I wouldn't have been happy. To and the continue. first three, yeah. we laughed our heads off. Yes. Uh, increasingly so, I think. Mm. Yes. And this, it all felt a bit flat, didn't it? It did. Flat, yeah. It did. Yes. And, you know, we, we sort of sat down and thought about it. This is a couple of years on from, from you yeah. know. It's, it's rushed. And we were saying, mm. well, why didn't you use a bit more on this scene? You could have extended this and got more laughs yeah. that way. And... But the series <laughs> lasts one more season after this in 1987. So there's nothing in 1986. Yeah. Um, and Do you the, think it had a rest then? And well, I, d I don't know how much better or worse the or last was Terry Hill, then, season the was. Um, but one thing we d have to say is that all the ones that we laughed at were produced by Peter Whitmore, mm -hmm. yeah. and the ones that we the one we hasn't haven't laughed at yes. is Robin Nash Robin and Martin Nash. Shardler. Yes. Yeah. And we've already said before, we like Martin Shardlow. Yeah, because he does my favourite Are You Being Served, you said. And, of course, yeah. Series 1 of Blackadder. Yeah. So I just wonder... If it's uh, the producer. Whether, yeah, whether this change of production team has, has unsettled everyone a bit. Well, I really don't know. Same, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Which the, means it should still be funny. Yeah. I mean, there there are... As for the previous season, we have got new, we have got different writers in. So maybe he's you've got, running you've got out of Colin ideas. Colin Bostock Smith, that's a quality writer. You've got Eric Merriman, yeah. John Chapman, yeah. Greg Freeman. So, yeah, we, uh, in fact, Terry Ravenscroft as well. So Was John, um, do you think John was dealing with something else at that time as well? well I, I, don't, I, don't I think he's run out of ideas. Yeah. To be honest. I mean, which is a shame. Yeah, which mm. is a great shame. Production wise, they spent more money on it, you can tell. Yeah. Because you've got the whole filming sequence and it was night filming night sequence, filming yeah. even mm. uh you've got tv's michael charvel martin appearing as a butcher mm. yeah i don't know how much he cost but do you think that this is now terry and june is it's it's at its peak well it's sort of possibly i think it's probably its past it now it's... but it's is it part of the sort of center of entertainment of christmas and there's a lot of pressure. Ooh, I do, do hope it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest possible yeah. way because that, that then adds to the demise of the series, doesn't it? Yeah, I just wonder if there was too much pressure and they've tried too hard. Or are they all tired? Because it's the last, presumably it's the last one. It's a, long, it's a longer series. It's seven yeah. episodes. Well, of this night, you've got um, seven o'clock Telly Addicts Christmas special, um, The Pain Family. Uh, do you remember The Pains? Does that ring a bell? It does with I'm, me. Yeah, it does with me, yeah. Um, yeah. Versus Nina Miscow, or however you say it. Miscoff. I know what I mean. Barry Took, uh, Larry Grayson, and Michael Grade. Yeah, why the, in heaven's sake is Michael Grade on the television? He's not a star. Well, he thinks he is. He's well, a great EastEnders. Mm. Boom, boom, boom. The best Christmas they never had. And yeah, Kenny, Kenny Everett's mm. Christmas Carol, and A Question of Sport. Mm. So... It's not that... Kenny comedy Everett, packed is it yeah. 
Kenny well, Everett, I'd go for. Well, that's the thing. The Kenny Everett Chris, Christmas Carol, I think, well, is look probably at the lineup of people you got on. Very that. good. You got Milligan, Rashton, Peter Cook, John Wells. Yeah, mm. so that's that's a real solid thing. I think, un- unfortunately, Terry J- June is now being eclipsed by this. Yeah, and maybe nobody thinks they have to. <laughs> Why are you laughing at my stomach? My stomach is not funnier than a Terry and June Christmas special. It is today. It is, it is today. today. It's this one, yeah. You're singing carols in there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Have you got BT in there? I, I have not. Because <laughs> um, we, did, we did wonder whether the uh, pantomime cow was uh the rent-a-ghost was the re- was the rent ghost mob but it isn't no. thankfully mm. um they were obviously busy elsewhere yes. doing decent things <laughs> but mm. yeah so not a not maybe the best one to end on no but i think three out of four will, will score that one as, yes. as, as being entertainment what just just want to add that one you bring in that one that's a little weird to have on christmas entertainment wasn't what's it? that cagney, cagney, and, cagney lacey. and lacey at mm. quarter to ten yeah mm. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't know where they scheduled Cagney and Lace no. at this point. We have to look that up. But uh, mm-hmm. anyway, do you want to do you want to end with the final cracker? Yes. And this one's got to be for the listeners at home, isn't yes. it? You can pull this. So one you out. two can pull it. Oh, I was going to say. Shall I pull it? You All right. Pull it with Lisa. Lisa okay. and Andrew will pull it then. Right. Yeah. Okay. Ready. Grasp. Grasp it firmly, I'm Lisa. It firmly. Ooh, go on two hands. Ooh. Ooh. Blimey. Call me walnuts. <laughs> Can you get it out, Lisa? These, these crackers I would put out are several years old now, so Oh you've got a you've got a ruler. I've got a ruler which goes mm-hmm. up to is three... it Queen Elizabeth the second. How big is that, Lisa? Not very. Three inches. Three inches but... <laughs> you've got another pink hat. There's a lot of pink hats in here. What are you laughing at my inches for? <laughs> no, what's okay. the joke? And the joke is What do you call an elephant that flies? What? what do you call an elephant that flies? A jumbo jet. Yes. <laughs> okay, a Merry Christmas to all of you at home. Merry Christmas, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. That was episode 30. 30! Of Round the Archives. Starring Lisa Parker, Andrew Trobish, Warren Cummings, Martin Holmes and Ben Baker. Thanks also to Tim Worthington and Gareth Hirons. On the musical side you heard Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. The scripts for the Terry and June Christmas specials were by John Kane. And the producers were Peter Whitmore. And Robin Nash. Right, Lisa and Andrew are not expecting what I'm about to ask them. So um, this is the end of the year, and I'm going to well, ask not them... Not yet, it's not. <laughs> oh, isn't it? All right. It's nearly the end. <laughs> it will be when we release it. But yeah. um, I'm going to throw a couple of questions at them, first of all. Mm, one they've had sort of pre-warning of, but I'm not going to go straight in with that one. All right. I'm going to ask you, what subject matter has changed your opinion about uh, a particular programme? Oh, God. Mm. And this is through... All the wonderful mm. episodes that you have done are around the archives. Mm. Ooh, that's a hard one. That is quite a hard one to start off with. I'm trying to think of something that we, I didn't think I was going to enjoy and ended up enjoying a lot. And I can't think of anything at the moment. 
Well, I um, think it's more... I'm going to slightly divert it, because I think it's... We've chosen sort of things on, on whims often. Cause yes. Because you, you, you sometimes say, well, it might be interesting to try yeah. that show. And, mm-hmm. and you just take a punt on it, knowing virtually nothing about it so mm-hmm. i think it's not so much stuff that i've had a an opinion about beforehand it's stuff that i've had no opinion or have never heard about so it's things like zodiac yes that we uh, were surprised about zodiac because because i i you got it for my birthday didn't you a couple hmm. of years ago and i put it on the list because we'd been watching Who Done It, and every time john pert we introduced anushka hempel we'd say star of zodiac yeah and i thought oh, i wonder it might be interesting to see that and i looked it up and it wasn't that expensive and i said to you you could get me that and i i didn't half, half expect you not to because i knew it was the kind of subject you you don't really approve of <laughs> but when we started watching it we really enjoyed it because yeah. um she uh, anushka hempel and anton rogers have got a great relationship they work really well together their mm. characters work really well together and i think his character really grounds it and it's only what six episodes six episodes and we really wish there were more and i could have done with 12 quite yeah. happily yeah. um well you've got they, they should have done I 12. Done 12 yeah one for each of the each of the signs of the zodiac, signs of the zodiac yeah. yeah but i mean yeah i mean shows like crown court i love crown court i yeah. again we got just because it was your birthday, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. It was the year of my birth. It was first shown when yeah, I was and, forty. And I d- went into it probably with the opinion that most people that haven't seen it, it's that it was that thing that was on when you were ill, off school, mm. and you didn't watch it because it was boring. But you know, a bit of hindsight and actually sitting down yeah. and making the effort. Has really, really paid off. I mean, and... particularly the the one that we covered for, for the podcast, "How to Steal a Memory Bank," mm. is outstanding. For when it was made, it show it portrays portrays a character who would now be labelled would be recognised as being autistic, mm. but then it's just looked at as being a bit strange. But it's treated with respect. Yeah, it's not. They don't take you know, they don't sort of take the Mickey out of them, which. I would have thought they might have done. I mean, our our approach has always been to try and look for the, for the positive in things. Yeah, so it? we don't do stuff that we wouldn't like. No, um, because um, Simon Exton of the Exton Moss Experiment sent me a list of things, suggestions of things we should do, mm. and I immediately ruled out a couple of them because I think he suggested Threads, and I was like, no, I don't want to watch Threads. And he suggested The Mad Death. I'm like, no, I don't want to watch The Mad Death. Why would I want to watch The Mad Death? So and 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 um, our house and I went. No, we've seen one episode of that. We didn't like it. It's like, <laughs> Simon's going to probably sit, argue with you about. He that, would argue with that, and he's he's perfectly in his right to do so. But from our opinion, it wasn't very good. Yeah, but yeah, it's that's the thing. It's it's more things surprise us based on no knowledge than than I don't think we've had any great changes no. of, of opinion otherwise. No. Really, I mean. <laughs> You know, it's that it's that thing that people sometimes sort of suggest shows that we know nothing about, mm-hmm. and it's often more interesting to let somebody else look at that, yeah. like, like Andy's done with Maelstrom, mm-hmm. and Paul's done with Dark Shadows mm-hmm. recently, and Paul, ironically, has not only encouraged Andy to start watching Dark yeah. Shadows, even I've done a couple of episodes yes. in the last couple of days, yeah. so... You know, in the 90s, Paul was sort of, you know, obviously very keen on it, but I never had the sort of time or ability to actually sit down and watch mm-hmm. it but I, i'm probably going to dip my toe in in the water a bit more over the next mm-hmm. you know few weeks or months just to just to see where it goes but we shall see mm-hmm. well, we'll get back to you on dark shadows i think yes well thanks for that one thanks for being so candid to the answers that uh-huh. one um and finally, this mm. one that I threw in a few moments ago, and then I said to you, can we grab the recorder? Because I'm really interested in the answer for this one. When did you realise, or when when did you feel that, uh, uh, at what level, after doing... You've done 30 now. Well, well more or less. By, by the time yeah. this is out, we'll have done 30, yes. yes. At what point did you realise it was becoming a success? Hmm. Again, difficult. I... It, it didn't take us long to, I think, establish a basic format. The first one we just threw together. Yes. 
you know. And it's it's a bit of a, a hodgepodge, the first one, because we've got, we do, we review archive stuff. Mm. We look at, because when we did that one, the BBC were showing some of their landmark um, sitcoms, remakes and um, sort of pilots for things that didn't go on to do anything. Mm. So things like they remade um, in, no, uh, in Sickness in the House. Yeah. And um, Hancock. Till Death is Dupont. Death is Dupont. I yeah. can never remember which one of those comes first. And um, uh, there's the end. oh, Steptoe and Son yeah. as well. And we talk about the the um, Till Death Do Us Part. Yeah. And the remake of that, which we quite, both quite enjoyed. But we, we don't really do much current television after that. No, I mean the, the the early ones relied on help from people that we knew could do it so we get nick we get you mm-hmm. a bit later on we get paul so that's mm-hmm. our like that's our core group of contributors that we know that of all so we knew had experience of doing this sort of thing anyway but it's when you start introducing people that you've never actually met mm-hmm. and that's the point you think oh actually people are interested enough to to take part. Yeah, to commit themselves. And I'm dreadful about asking people I don't know. Mm. And it's surprising how many people that I don't know that we've suggested it to that have been happy to do something. Yeah. And, and mm. that's the point. You think, oh, actually, people quite like this. Mm-hmm. And as I said to you when you asked us sort of before we started recording, when people that you respect, you know, the work that they've done, actually seem to like what you've done a bit yeah. and are happy to even not necessarily contribute but to help you with sort of facts and things like that and mm-hmm. you know that there are people that um have never particularly wanted to do an article but are still very happy to help us out with with the odd the odd bit um and there's no reason why they should because no. you know we're taking up their time no. but i mean martin's a good example of that because I only knew Martin really from his work in sort of TARDIS um, fanzine around about 1985 and um, some of the cartoons he did about 1987. And we just thought, well, let's ask him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I remembered that he'd, he'd done stuff and I thought he was, you know, a good writer and a, a, a talented artist as well. So the fact that somebody like that has been so keen. Mm. To 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 keep doing stuff, yeah. Um, it, you think, oh no, actually, we we must be doing yeah. something right, cause... and to do all all the pictures and cartoons and covers yeah. and all that sort of thing as well. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. We we know we know Paul will, will happily do something. Yeah. You know, we know you'll come round and watch some telly with us and and, and be silly and be silly, <laughs> and, and 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 we know that sort of Nick enjoys doing that. And mm. but but yeah, I've no, I've known that for twenty years or more. Yeah. So. It's no great surprise, but yeah. and the one issue when I think about the one issue an article I am really pleased with, and I don't know what episode it's on. Do you know what episode it's on? If I is, find the episode guide, the, I can um, tell you. Heidi High article we did, which Ooh, was ridiculously that's... forty-five minutes long, <laughs> and I could have probably gone on for at least another five ten minutes. And I did start to panic a bit because I started getting wind up signs. Heidi like, oh. High is episode 19. Yeah. How do I finish this? But yeah, and it's, it's, I really enjoyed doing that. And we, we sent the link to Jeffrey Holland, who was obviously in it. And he very kindly replied and said he'd enjoyed it. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's when you get somebody involved in it and they say, yeah, that's, we, I, I really like that. So, I mean, it's true now that I do have to look at the episode guide to remind me what's on which issue. Yes. Which wasn't a problem in the first sort of six issues. Mm-hmm. But now we're, you know, coming up and we're doing 30 and I haven't a clue. But let's just look at 19. Now you've, mm-hmm. now you've said about that. Yes. I think 19 is quite, quite an interesting range, actually, because mm-hmm. it's got Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. Yeah. Um, with a little bit of the goodies with mm-hmm. the Bigfoot episode. Um, you and me did How. Mm-hmm. That was quite fun, Warren. Uh, Paul and Nick did Thriller, which we still haven't got around to watching. No, we've got it. Got it on DVD. Got it. Got so much stuff on DVD from other people's articles. And then you big, did your big Heidi High one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I again, I'm going to apologise for my appalling attempt at a Welsh accent. Is that the one where I was having to do wind up? Yes, you did towards... wind up signals, and 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 because I was I, going to think, I, blimey, we're hitting forty minutes. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I, 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 as I said, I started sort of panic, panic a little bit because I'm like, how do I finish this really quickly? 
but, but yeah. uh, let's turn it around, Warren. Um, when we first suggested to you, would you help out? Um, what What did you think? Because as you know, you've done so, you did some very early editions of Ray Fay Shift, and you and I sort of did some tape scenes. But it's a long time. There's a long gap isn't there between what we did in the 80s and what we're doing now i don't remember doing much with you sort of in those intervening years no, in we, sort we of audio i sort of moved away um audio wise yeah as soon as you mentioned it i did have quivers of going back to local group audio yeah we've moved on since then the the, the we uh, we we've come together again in the last what 10 15 years yeah longer probably yeah um, but we've viewed so much and gathered so much knowledge. Yeah, I think it's ideal. But and we think, and also I knew I would never have the fear of drying mm. because if I if I lost pace, you would come in and likewise. Yeah, well, we, you, you you can trace it all back to what we did in the eighties. You know, the, the the seeds of it are there, aren't they? There's, there's a definite line you can draw between. You know, then and now, but as you say, we, is it any different though? Are we're not we really, really? It's just the technology that's different. We're just, we are doing the same jokes. We are definitely <laughs> doing the same jokes. <laughs> just, yes. just, to, just to a slightly wider audience and with better audio quality. Yeah, but um, I think the library that we have now. Well, there it is in front of us. The library that you have now is vastly superior to what we had. Well, it, it's when we the got availability. The but even then, in the eighties. We were Doctor Who fans, but not to the exclusion of everything Absolutely. else. Yeah. And I think th that this is what I always say to people that, you know, there are a lot of people discovering old Doctor Who, and that's brilliant. But I would say there's more yeah. old telly to discover than just old Doctor Who. It's mm -hmm. like wandering down a corridor with several doors off of it. Mm. You can either open, carry on walking down the corridor, yeah. or you can explore the little anterooms off of it. Yeah. Which is why, I, as, as you said, Lisa, we never wanted to make this a Doctor Who no. podcast. Yeah. That, that was far too restrictive. And, you know, doing things like How, mm. you know, doing things like Terry and June. Is, yeah. You... you it, there's just so much more to discover and you've got the advantage that a lot of this there's very little there's very little you know, places where you can go for this sort of stuff is mm -hmm. there that there aren't books on how and things like that you know there's books which mention it in passing but you know to do sort of 15 20 minutes on some of these subjects we could do that we could do those forever frankly mm -hmm. um you know, we could we could do a, we could do a Z cars every month. Yeah. We could do if we, we wanted to. Do. Or Not, Dixon Jock Green. Yeah. Or uh, Sergeant Cole. And and you could do that for years. Mm. We we jump about all over the place, and I I think that's what keeps it interesting, because mm. some of the time we plan it a long way ahead, mm. and some of the time we sort of think a week before before and oh let's do that, mm. and we've got that flexibility. I think that's where the format of yeah. it of it works um occasionally we'll end up with a themed issue or two which is what happened with the american mm -hmm. ones but for next year i don't know what we're going to do for a lot of it yet i know what some of the articles are because we've already got them but it could go anywhere could mm. do anything and you know even with issue 30 we've slightly played around with the format by doing the sort of terry and june stuff sort of broken up mm -hmm. um and I don't know what the format's going to be in a year's time. No, no idea. <laughs> and that's quite <laughs> exciting, isn't it? Yes, yeah, definitely. But it, it can go. It can go in lots of different ways. Passions can take you in all directions. Yeah. And as you say, you're opening doors to new and exciting programs, new knowledge that you're. you're well, that, that's the point. We are learning stuff every month, and we're just mm. and and that's the joy of it. I think it's not just storylines; it's production values, mm. it's history, it's the actors that take part. You go, I can do a chronological tree to what they've been in. Yeah, and, and the more we see, the more connect. It's it is. It, it, I think you said once it's the James Burke connections approach to archive TV. Yeah, and I can't claim to have invented it. I'm just following 
what, you know what what sort of James Burke sort of laid down that you, as you say, you can look at an actor and see, oh, they did that and they did that. But it's that information is now available. Um, you've got IMDb, you've got Wikipedia. They're not always the best sources, but you've got BBC Genome as mm. well. And that, to us, has been yeah. a great, great help. Help yeah. just to be able to see what was on that day, mm-hmm. what was on before the program you're talking about what was on after the program what was on bbc2 mm. did that actor appear in anything else that same day yeah and sometimes they do yeah. and you have that great following of contributors yeah and listeners who will chip in with well that, that that's pieces. the thing we, we cannot say thank you enough to everybody that yes. is happy to you know just throw in a few extra facts yeah. and go you know mm. that's missing that you know that survives as a film in uh, you know such and such also did this and just point pointing you in other things to look at you know there's no way we can cover everything everybody sort of points out that it's just impossible mm-hmm. um but it always sort of keeps you on your toes i think that's mm-hmm. the thing i don't i don't think we sort of we might joke we might say oh let's just churn it out churn out another one but i don't think we do that because people would pull you up on that they mm-hmm. say oh you've been a bit slack this yeah. this month so <laughs> being able to find like carl sagan's airline ticket is just the sort of stuff i love um because <laughs> you don't you don't find that without a bit of looking yeah <laughs> and I, I think we we've got the enthusiasm to do that yes but uh, <laughs> but i just wanted to say you know thank you to everyone that's yes thank you you know without you we probably wouldn't have lasted this long no, we'd have I got, mean, we'd have got to about three or four yeah, extra people helping it, yeah. is you know it's been a tremendous help yeah there's no way we could do yeah. this just the two or three of us i don't think so you're all wonderful uh, you all done very well thank, thank you, you mr grace. grace and on that note thank you very much indeed for your listeners uh, you contributors <laughs> yeah and good luck for 2019 oh blimey <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye.